welcome to the select board meeting of Monday, February 24th, 2020. Uh, my name is Diane M. Mahan, to my right and at home your left. John Hurt. Joe Puro. Uh, Dan Dunn. Steve DeCourcy. Adam Chapteling, town manager. Doug Heim, town council. Ashley Marr, admin assistant. Thank you. Uh, first agenda item is a report, a presentation from the Community Preservation Act Committee. I brought a sidekick. Hi, uh, Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Community, Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Okay. Um, Clarissa Rowe, Vice Chair of the Committee. And I'm here to talk about the Community Preservation Plan, which is first on your ward article list um, before Eric goes into our um, presentation. I just wanted to tell you that most Community Preservation Act committees have a um, preserva community preservation plan. We had a draft one, and we're going to have a final one. Um, we want to go to the public probably in April or at the end of March to get people's ideas about community housing and historic preservation and open space. So that's why it's on the Warren article. And now I'll turn it over to the leader. Thank you very much, Eric Helmuth, again, the chair of the CPA committee. CPA stands, in this case, for Community Preservation Act. And just as a very quick recap as to what it is, <coughs> it is a source of dedicated funding for three important areas to the community's vibrancy and well-being. And that is historic preservation, so that we remember who we have been and who we are, open space and recreation, so that we can enjoy the beauty of, of that space around us and preserve it, and community housing so that we can help make Arlington a place and the community is a place where everyone can live. The CPA provides a dedicated funding stream through a small so local sex tax surcharge and a state uh, uh, matching fund that allows us to take those funds and do even more with them. And I'm going to talk some a bit about what CPA is able to do when we uh, bring to you tonight for consultation and for discussion and for information about the projects that we are considering as we look to town meeting. As you know, the CPA committee is only the gatekeeper. Town meeting writes the checks. So we make the motions to the town meeting for appropriating project funds. Town meeting actually makes the final decision. So we are in our process right now. We have a pretty good idea of what we tend to put forward, and I'm going to be talking about that tonight. Every year, the three areas that are funded under CPA have some minimum reservations. So 10% of the annual income that we're expecting from the local tax surcharge or from the state fund need to go to each of the areas as a minimum. So we do those reserves right off the top. The rest of the money is flexible. The little gray sliver, we are allowed to keep or to ask town meeting for up to 5% of those revenues for our administrative expenses. The, this coming year, we are planning to ask for just 2.75%. We've found kind of our, our happy place for that. Most of that uh, funding covers some staff in the town manager's office that are instrumental in administering the program. Next slide. So the projects before you, and you have in your uh, documents a grid, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the budget at the end of this. But the projects that we are actively considering are as follows. First up, the continuing restoration of the Jason Russell House. I love this project because they started with CPA funds to build a comprehensive conditions assessment and preservation plan that has guided every single time they've come back to us for a funding request. So this is the third uh, amount of funds that they've asked for, and it's all, always been about this range of, of funds. And what's been amazing to me is the Historical Society has taken the investments that we've made in CPA and invested them to use, use them as the required local match. And they have received to date about $180,000 in additional funding directly because of CPA's uh, ability to be a catalyst to assist in the preservation. So the money is going to an ongoing uh, work on the envelope, the foundation repair, windows, 
uh, just about everything you can imagine in a house of that age, but it's one of Arlington's and the state's most important national uh, historic resources, and it is an absolute pleasure to be able to fund that. You can see that this is not the most beautiful picture of the house, but I showed you this photograph because right out in front on the corner is, uh, is a statement, a strong statement of how the people of Arlington are contributing to this through their investment in CPA. Next up is another continuation of investment that CPA has made possible and another continuation of leveraged funding where our, our little bit of CPA money has been able to be invested and produce some returns. So the Mr. River Waters Shed Association, working very closely with the town planning department, has used CPA funds and prior awards first to do a comprehensive study and plan and then to do phase one uh, of improvements to the park. This is the park that most people think of as the tennis courts by the DPW, but it's actually much more than that. And one of the purposes of this project is to open up the park to uncover part of Mill Brook, which is right there. And one of the nice uh, things that happened in the fa first phase of funding a couple of years ago was that the town was able to use the CPA grant as the local match to get $400,000 in a municipal vulnerability preparedness grant that dovetailed beautifully with the phase, first phase of the work. If you would, um, this, these pictures are actually from the work that was done previously in this graph, uh, this map shows that, that there was a beautiful boardwalk installed. The MVP grant went to flood storage and invasive removal, and the rest of the funds went to just uncovering, to, uh, t tearing out a horrible chain link, link fence, improving the, the path, installing some signage to get people to raise awareness that this is a great, um, natural resource that we hope to build on. The next phase that they are uh, asking us to contemplate would be the second and final phase of construction where we would extend that path. There's a bridge that's, as you can see, uh, pictured there over, over the brook um, in need of restoration and repair. So that would be um, shored up to guard against flood events in the future and you know, kind of complete this, this work along with some other plantings and uh, a, a rain garden in the area. So next, the reservoir likewise is another open space and recreation area that we have been able to invest in. This is a, a large ongoing project. CPA is part of the funding. The other funding has come from the capital plan in various channels. Uh, but this year they're asking us to contemplate an additional contribution that would uh, continue the trail and perimeter improvements because a lot of people think of the res as the swimming beach. But in reality, it's a really great recreational resource all the way around. And the, the path has a lot of problems, especially mobility-wise. So there are ADA improvements, erosion control improvements in that uh, recreational path uh, that will supplement and, and help us make a lot more out of the res than, than simply the swimming beach, which of itself is part of this plan. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the, the installment there for this. The old burying ground is a historic preservation initiative. This is the burying ground that is next to the library, between the library and Pleasant Street. This is the second phase of CPA funding the town has sought. And the, the boundary wall, which is historic but is also crumbling, a stone wall, and is a safety hazard as well as just an, a, a risk to the historic asset, um, is in desperate need of repair. It's expensive, tedious, uh, expert work. We were able to successfully repair the areas in the black dots that, uh, that you see there. In the first phase, the second phase would take the area of red as, much, as far as we can down to the Unitarian Church and perhaps bending the corner. And that's being very, very ably led by the uh, assistant town manager, Jim Feeney, and we are grateful to him for his work. Next, please. Uh, another uh, continuation, uh, and again, an another project we are enormously proud to have contributed to is the restoration of the Robbins Memorial Garden right here next to Town Hall. Uh, a major CPA grant from two years ago went to restoring the water features and getting those up and running again. And um, this is a much smaller grant that's been proposed by the Historical Commission and the Friends of the Gardens to restore the original plannings to the Olmsted Brothers design. This is an Olmsted Brothers designed park. And uh, the, this work would, would simply just beautify the park and make kind of complete that project to uh, make it as beautiful as it once was. Next up, we have uh, a slate of small planning projects that were proposed by the town of Arlington. And um, 
The open space and recreation plan is required every few years in order to qualify us for state conservation grants, so that's a really good investment. Uh, the archaeological survey is an investment in protecting what resources may be there. So its, it's purpose is to identify and document prehistoric and historic uh, artifacts that may be in key places around town so these can be mapped so that we can start to, uh, we can apply for funds if, if necessary to preserve them and to s formulate a plan to protect them in the context of development so that we know what's there and we can have a, have a good idea what's there. The Historic Municipal Resources is a continuation of another CPA funded project whereby the town, when it properly documents some of its town owned properties uh, on the historic register is then eligible for preservation grant money. So that's another way that we want to use this as seed money for future uh, funding. And finally, the, the uh, Department of Planning and, and Community Development has proposed the Minute Maid Bikeway uh, planning grant to take a long-term look at the long-term maintenance needs of Arlington section of this transportation corridor and also to look at some of the new forms and modes of transportation that are coming into being, some of the electric uh, mobility and some of the low-speed mobility and how are pedestrians interacting with the cyclists, uh, are there infrastructure improvements we should be considering, um, and this will be done in, in concert with the sustainable transportation plan work that's being done, um, so that's also before us. So quickly, uh, the budget, and it's, I know it's a little too hard to see on your screen, but you do have it in front of you. This is where we stand right now. These are the projects we are considering. We will take our votes on this in uh, March before we go to town meeting. Uh, this year, I want to note that we did not receive any affordable housing applications. We were disappointed by that. Um, but I'm glad to say that you can see the red box there, which is not on your documents in front of you, that I just simply did the math, the two tables, that if all these appropriations move through our committee and go, to, and go through the town meeting, uh, we would still have $724,000 in change to put in the bank. And that would be available for town meeting to reserve for appropriation for, for, for reserve for future appropriation, but would have to be spent on future CPA projects. So it would stay there and would be eligible for, for affordable housing in the future, and we hope very much next year to see some robust applications in that, in that area. Some good news with the state match is you can see that uh, in the, the lower left table there that the, the estimated revenues, regular revenues from this tax surcharge are about $1.8 <coughs> The regular state match money came in at just 14% or 220000 um, we had some additional funds, as, as, uh, as noted, but one of the biggest sources of those additional funds was a state budget surplus, and the governor and legislature actually uh, allocated $20 million to the state CPA trust fund to shore that up and raise our effective match to Clarissa. I think it was about 23% um, this year. And we, we're looking forward to next year with uh, this legislature also uh, signed and enacted a, an increase in the fees that fund, that feed that state matching fund, so we are hope, we're hopeful that the, we're going to be able to hold the line on that better state match. So that, that gave us 217, almost $218,000 extra this year, so uh, we are optimistic that we'll be able to hold somewhere around that um, in the coming years. We welcome your questions, your advice, your thoughts. Um, any questions from my colleagues um, at this point? because this is also going to fall under the Warren Article hearing, Article 66. Um, is it my colleagues, do you want to move receipt, or what's the motion? I can't. Well, I think we can move a receipt, and then okay. we want to take the, uh, the Warren Article out of order. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any further questions or comments by my colleagues? Yeah, that's a good one. So um, on the affordable housing, uh, refresh my memory, who have been the applicants we've funded in the past? We have funded the Housing Corporation of Arlington and the Arlington Housing Authority. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because in the CDBG funding cycle, we actually kind of found a similar thing, that we didn't get a ton of housing, uh, affordable housing applications. We did get one from the Housing Corporation. And uh, I was, and so, and, uh, we have some members, so the CDBG subcommittee consists of a couple, uh, like two of us in the select board, town manager, someone from the, uh, a couple of people from the planning department sit in, and three 
uh, citizen members. And uh, two of the three citizen members had the same question. They're like, why aren't we getting more affordable housing applications? And I didn't have a good answer for it. I think my colleague may have an answer. It Um, I, I talked to Pam Hallett of the Housing Corporation of Arlington about it, and they are a small, a small organization, and they are in the process of the project in Westminster, and they've broken ground in the adjacent project, and they're also doing the Broadway Initiative project. And their feeling was they had too much on their plate, and that they, you know, any kind of housing project requires extraordinarily um, labor-intensive grants from many different sources, and they just didn't feel they could do um, the right kind of investment for this this year. I'm hoping that next year they will be able to. Yeah. I definitely didn't mean in my comment in any way about this negative about the Housing Corporation because they have been doing, like, yes. if I, and they have work. been making requests. And it's a, right. it was more about how, huh, like, that, like the, yeah. the, the list of groups that would make an application is thin. Yes. It wasn't that the Housing Corporation exactly. wasn't doing it. It's, we were wondering. We only have two so far. Right. And I think they're, um, the planning department is thinking possibly of having, you want to talk about that? The, uh, ha having a housing fund. And, but I think that's early on, so that would also be another source of funding. But we, we agree, you know, this is a, a problem right now. People need affordable places to live. I think the one thing I would add is, um, as we go through our process to revise and finalize the community preservation plan, this is one key <coughs> area that we really need input from stakeholders, from the public, from the leadership, because there isn't that much CPA money every year. It adds up. You know, it, it's between 1.5 and 2 million a year. That, that's good. What's really powerful is it's a dedicated funding stream and it's, it's a useful catalyst for matching funds. But by itself, it's not a lot. That said, so we, we're very conscious that it's the public's money and we want to invest it in, in congruence with the public's priorities. So to the extent that we prioritize housing, um, you know, in a budget like this, we, I think we'd like to hear from folks and we'd like to, to know what we've done. Historically, we have, by practice, but not formal policy, allocated at least $500,000 a year to housing uh, projects. And I think that's just a statement of values, frankly. Um, so I think that we would welcome your thoughts on that. Um, now, later, as part of our hearing process, when we, when we adopt the plan, because we really do want to listen. Uh, one of the other things, the housing projects bring in the largest grants from outside. And I think the total grants brought in are about $12 million into Arlington for affordable housing. And that is tremendous because that's that it's our seed money and the CBDG seed money that bring in, you know, lots and lots of federal and state dollars. Okay, Mr. Carroll. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wonder, through you, Ms. Rowe, you, you mentioned the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund is being proposed through the, the, from, um, the uh, Planning Community Development. And they talked a little bit about that when we had our joint meeting with the Redevelopment Board, too. Could you talk about what, what is the benefit there? So because there's a 10% community housing reserve, so that obviously is carrying forward through the, the CPA accounting. Is that to allow for a, if, if for example, the, the affordable housing portion of CPA were appropriated to the uh, affordable housing trust fund. Does that, does that just make it more streamlined for a consolidated grant application? I'm going to let the town council speak to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the things that the affordable housing trust would be able to do is if the CPA and any other funding sources essentially built up the trust enough, the trust isn't on a town meeting timeline or even the CPA grant timeline. It means that if there's an opportunity to invest in affordable housing or a specific need that arises at a time of year that's not very convenient to the CPA's grant process or even town meeting, that they'd have that money as essentially a liquid asset. Mm -hmm. um, it's particularly advantageous for the acquisition of property mm -hmm. if the, um, there was a potential project um, that the Affordable Housing Trust might acquire and then dispense of in a later subsequent um, 
uh, measure that might be compatible with the CPA that might include, for example, CPA dollars to help support a rehab of an affordable housing trust uh, purchased property that would be administered by AHA or the housing court, something of that nature. Great. Thank you. And I just had one other question on uh, the reservoir project. My recollection is that in phase one, one of the things that was happening is that a number of different surface materials were being tested out on the, on the uh, perimeter. Is, is phase two a acting on a decision around that to uh, extend it? <laughs> she knows more about this than I do. Um, one of the problems that we had at the beginning of phase one yeah. was that the bids that came in yeah. were way beyond the expectations in the budget. <coughs> so some of the work has been delayed some. So those surfaces, um, that they haven't been through the kind of, I, I think some of them will be installed this spring, okay. but that's um, one of the reasons it's a, we're in an, another phase. Okay. is bid prices right now for public work are skyrocketing. I think partially because of the tariffs that are going on metals. Um, my, I'm finding in my public bids, and I do almost all public bid work, um, the prices have just skyrocketed, and that's what's happened to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions, and thank you for the presentation. Um, on the 10% the reserve, is there a requirement that uh, this year there may not be funds to spend, so that the reserve the money is going to be put in to the reserve, but how long can that be carried over before you actually have to identify a project? Perpetuity. To my, to my knowledge, and, and uh, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no, there's no limit. I think that it's, it's once it's reserved, uh, in a designated area, so if it's a housing reserve or historic preservation reserve, um, that has to be spent in those areas. Now, what we normally do, in, in most years, what we've done is is we have a, a, a almost a paper transaction where the first town meeting vote under our article reserves those because that establishes a paper trail. If there are any turnbacks of a project doesn't happen, then we are retroactively in compliance with the requirement to spend 10% every year. But I think that moving forward, if we don't spend those right away on a project appropriation in the same meeting, that those, those do sit there and are, are uh, eligible at any point in the future. Okay. In, in the question on the, on the state match, it's 14.1% of last year's um, Mm -hmm. CPA is what's projected. How does that compare to what the match was a year ago, per percentage-wise? Higher. Yeah, it's okay. a little bit higher. And 11%. then, in the, yes, it was 11. And with, and effectively, with with the bonus money from the state uh, surplus, then it was it was above 22, 23 percent. Okay, thank you. And, and then, last question, on the unspent um, funds. I, I guess that was just unspent administrative funds. Everything else that was funded was uh, the projects were worked on and completed or their phases were completed? Or the, well, yeah, the unspent, the unspent administrative funds would have been uh, excess from our, uh, the discretionary administrative account for the committee. Okay. Uh, project funds, yeah, the projects are in progress. Sometimes that if, they, if they don't start right away, the money is still held for them. You know, the award is still valid um, and we haven't, you know, we haven't had a situation yet come up where the where project doesn't happen. Right. Sometimes there's a delay, but that there's no problem with that. Great, thank you. Mr. Hart. It's good to see so much investment into our historic structures in this plan. Um, I know over the past couple of years, we've been, we've been doing renovations to the Jason Russell House. Are, is there an ongoing plan that's identified, you know, what renovations and repairs are necessary for our historic structures as a whole that's getting, you know, picked off year by year with CPA requests? Or is it just as each year successively the individual entities have to come in? And um, it is um, because that's a private, yeah. it's not a public entity. I think the town is keeping track of the public, publicly owned buildings sure. and landscapes. And this is because it's privately held, it isn't. But I think that the checklist, the historic resources checklist, which again is only for public buildings and landscapes, will be keeping track of that, but there isn't anything. I mean, we, we will have, we have a preliminary list of everything we funded, and that's something that we'll be talking about in the public meeting that we have. And I think that's gonna be 
pretty interesting because the reason CPA was started in the first place was those <coughs> areas, housing, um, historic preservation, and open space have been were chronically underfunded, and that's how CPA was started in 2000 and 2001. That's why it was signed. So all the re resources in Arlington are being the old Schwab Mill. You know, some things that really bring value to the town are are slowly being fixed up, which is nice. And I mentioned that because I talked about this briefly in new business in our last meeting, but I attended a meeting a couple of weeks ago with some select board members from surrounding towns, and we discussed the 2025 yes. um, Patriots Day event, which is slated to be quite an event, the semi-quincentennial yes. celebration, and they talked about the, pre the then president of the United States visiting this area, and you know, a lot of great events going on, so it'd be, you know, the CPA is doing this anyways. Yeah, um, but are you ready can, for that we are, we are ready for it. The Scenic Byway Committee that is made up of Arlington, Lexington, um, Lincoln, and Concord have been talking about. We have the National Park as part of our group, yep. and we are talking about it. And one thing I would do is encourage um, setting up a committee t for Arlington because the other three towns have already done that. Hmm. Yep. <coughs> That onus is on my shoulders. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Not a few things going on, but yeah. Well, it is interesting though because it seems far away, but they want us to submit a plan yesterday. So. Right. All set. Yep. Okay, and a motion to move receipt uh, made by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote for continuity's sake, and so it's still fresh in our mind. <clears throat> we will take out of order a warrant article. Hearing for Article 66, a vote for the Community Preservation Act. Um, I sort of did that at the beginning. Huh? I did that at the beginning, and what I'm asking for, we are asking for, is a positive vote. We will have more substance to the motion as after we have our public meeting. Okay. Um, first, is there a motion? Oh, so moved. Move. Favorable action. Move approval by Mr. Carroll. Seconded by? Second. Mr. Dunn, um, any questions? Recognizing we haven't had the public hearing yet. Um, seeing none on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn to move approval. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now go to the consent agenda. We have the minutes of February 10, 2020, reappointments, Commission for Arts and Culture, Stephen Poulter Zaiki. To expire 131.23, Library Board of Trustees, jo Joyce Radosha, term to expire 6.30.2023, request common victual license DBA name change. Is Villa House of Pizza, hopes to be Boston Pizza and Curry, Sumendra Shrestha, a request for a special one day bear and wine license 314.20 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event, Karen Schwartz, an appointment of new election workers, Virginia A. Shannon of Sherbonne Street, Geraldine Padrini of Grandin Park, Benjamin Wall of Udine Street, Susan E. Bourne of School Street. First, is there a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Moved by Mr. DeCourcy. Second. Seconded by Mr. Caro. Uh, is there anyone here to speak to any of these, the common fixture or the special? Um, any, seeing none, um, any questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, on a motion to approve by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Kiro. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. Mrs. Mahan, may I uh, abstain from the minutes of February 10th? Okay. So it will be a 5-0 with the exception of number 2. It will be a 4-0-1. Thank you. And that's amenable to you, Mr. DeCourcy. Th th that's okay. Amenable. Sure. Okay. Um, now we go to appointments. Commission for Arts and Culture. Tom Formicola, term to expire 630 2021. Um, is he? Yes. You can just come up and once again just say your name. And I'm Tom Formicola. Nice to see you. Um, we have, the select board has materials before us, so we can see your credentials and um, your expertise. But if you could just give a little explanation of how you found the way to this sure. um, com commission and or what you hope to add on to 
et cetera. Sure. I'm the new executive director of the Arlington Center for the Arts. The commission kind of found me, though mm. I knew about them. I was paying attention. <laughs> um, uh, I have uh, lived in Arlington for 15 years. I was on the Arlington Cultural Council for six years. I think four of those years I served as the chair. So I've been involved uh, in the community, and I've been involved in the arts scene uh, in particular. And uh, and now with my new role at the Arlington Center for the Arts, I am you know ready to immerse myself really in the cultural scene of the town and I feel lucky to have been invited by my colleagues at the commission to join them. Thank you. Um, is there a motion? Uh, move approval. By Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, any further questions or comments? Um, duly impressed with um, what you're going to be bringing to Arlington from what you've done in the past, and um, we're really lucky to have you. And I know we'll be seeing a lot more of you, so I want to thank you for Great. adding this onto your plate. Of Happy to be here. Uh -huh. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. Agenda item eight for approval. Removal of one yellowwood tree and two Norway maple trees at Whittemore Park. Mr. Chapterling, town manager. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I'm actually going to quickly at your discretion, turn it over to Ali Carter from the planning department as well as the town's hired landscape architect, Naomi Cottrell, uh, to provide a little context uh, about the project as well as then go into detail about the project in general and then the request for the removal of the trees tonight. And I'm going to scroll through the presentation for you. Good evening. Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator. The Department of Planning and Community Development embarked, embarked on the project to make improvements to Whittemore Park in 2016 as part of the Mass Ave Phase II conceptual plan process. The department applied for and received a Community Preservation Act grant in 2017 to create a plan for Whittemore Park. The community visioning project for the park was launched in 2018 with the goal of creating a conceptual and schematic plan with cost estimates for construction. Public outreach for the project was extensive. Three community forums, a design day event for, um, in the park for public input, a survey that received over 500 responses from residents, and the work of a project committee, com com committee comprised of residents, members of the Arlington Historical Commission, the Historic Districts Commission, the Dallin Museum, the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, and the Arlington Chamber of Commerce all culminated in the Whittemore Park conceptual plan, which was released in August of 2018. The overall project goals of the conceptual plan, based on the feedback received during the community outreach, pro outreach process, were to improve circulation in the park, to increase visibility and prominence of the park, to cultivate opportunities for pa passive recreation, programs and events, and to enhance the historic, cultural, and natural landscape in Arlington Center. The community and design goals were to create a park that was democratic and that it could be used by many types of people, flexible and used for many kinds of activities, and a place that is beloved and inspires stewardship. In 2019, the department applied for and received another CPA grant to implement phase one of the plan, which includes the portion of the park in front of the Jefferson Cutter House under consideration this evening. It has been presented to and approved by the Massachusetts Historical Commission the Arlington Historical Commission, and also has support uh, from the Cyrus Stalin Museum, the Arlington Chamber of Commerce, and the Cutter Gallery, all located within the Jefferson Cutter House. To provide a more detailed overview of the project and the reason for our appeal tonight, I'd like to bring up Naomi Cottrell of Cali Crowley Cottrell Landscape Architecture. Thank you. Again, I'm Naomi Cottrell with Crowley Cottrell Landscape Architecture. Um, thank you for the, the uh, summary of our goals. We do have that listed here um, within our presentation. Um, but I want to walk you through and take this moment to go through uh, some of the planning and, and the reasons why we're here tonight. So go ahead and advance the slides. Um, the existing conditions of the park really, um, there are a lot of great assets to Whittemore Park that um, we're trying to balance with uh, the goals that were set forward in the planning process of really trying to bring more cultural and public gathering assets uh, to the community through renovation of the park. 
Um, some of the goals that we're trying to balance are not only um, improving the space, but also to preserve uh, the natural um, elements of the trees and, and the cultural elements of the railroad tracks and um, some of the existing landscape features. So if we can move forward just to give you a diagram of some of the things that um, we have been considering in the, the redesign process. Um, Currently, the, the park, as you can see in green, um, consists of a fragmented lawn, um, one that during our um, planning and outreach process, we heard a lot about um, the community wanting to have a centralized open space for program. Currently, uh, the paths that, that are designed lead to a singular focus of the front door of the Cutter House, um, really creating what we found, again, in our outreach as being the number one use for the park, which is as a cut-through. We found very few people who um, came out to our public process or responded to the surveys who actually stayed in the park and used it um, as a gathering place, which was one of the number one things that people were craving. One of the other things that the crossing paths within the park does currently is it cuts the, the remnant of the rail corridor, the tracks um, into two fragmented pieces. We are looking at and, and with the um, encouragement of Mass Historic into having the rail tracks be a more continuous piece within the park and also giving the opportunity for people to, in an accessible way, traverse down, down the length of it to be able to really look at it um, and, and folks with mobility issues to be able to do that in an accessible way. Um, and lastly, uh, the places to stop and rest currently in the park really do um, more focus on Mass Ave. Um, the, the benches are turned and faced towards the street rather than an interior space. So a lot of what we're also trying to do is to create gathering in the center so that there's an actual place um, in Whittemore Park rather than it being, again, a cut through or feeling like a place that is so connected just to the streets and the sidewalks. So our proposed diagram is, is such that we're creating a, a circuit path around, um, around a centralized lawn. Uh, the paths would all be of an accessible material and an accessible slope. Um, the, the red path that you see along the side of the rail corridor also would be an opportunity for more direct um, access along the length of the, of the tracks themselves, um, also an accessible pathway. Um, looking at providing benches that would be interior focused so that if there was a larger gathering going on in the center of the park, that it would be something that was um, more universally accessed, that people could really, um, in an accessible way, be able to uh, experience the totality of the park. I'll go ahead. Um, during the planning process and the conceptual um, process, we uh, hired an independent um, arborist, Bartlett tree experts, to evaluate the existing trees within the park. The trees in the park currently are suffering from um, the planning effort that was originally done when the park was first established, and the trees are, um, that are shown in red and in, in orange are trees that, based on the assessment, were considered poor or, or just fair, where the green is considered good quality. So you'll see that the um, lower half of the site, the site that's towards um, the pedestrian corridor on the old Mystic Street, are the healthier sets of trees, where the trees that are up on the corner of Mass Ave and Mystic are the ones that are over mature and of, um, are beginning to show a lot of signs of stress. So we look at this in the planning process um, to evaluate where we would want to stay away from, from trees. So the next slide, maybe it's a little light here, so I apologize for that, showing um, our new path network and where we are um, interfering with current trees. So one of the things, not only, again, balancing the cultural and the community um, wishes for gathering and improvement to the park, trying to balance the best trees that are in the park, again, the green trees, and making sure that we're doing the least amount of damage to those trees and not putting those into any sort of stress. Um, we'll go to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. 
So in this slide here, you can see that we have three trees that are identified as the trees for removal. Um, we have a 15 inch on the top of, um, of, the, of the slide here, a 15 inch Norway maple. Um, on, on your left hand side, a 22 inch caliper Norway maple. And then down at the bottom of the slide, a 15 inch caliper yellow wood. Um, if we go to the next slide, just to show you what those trees look like. The 15 inch caliper Norway maple, the one that is um, along the edge of Mystic, is um, in, in poor condition. This tree is um, a, it is wedged between the sidewalk and the uh, existing fence of the park. It's actually growing into both. Um, the canopy on it is predominantly over the sidewalk and it's an incredibly uneven crown. So this tree um, is one that is um, not getting any healthier. Um, it, is, uh, it is starting to definitely show lots of signs of failure. The yellow wood um, shown in the center of the screen here um, is uh, the only, can you, could you go back a slide? Is the, and then maybe back another slide. It's the one tree that was considered fair and not good within this side of the park. We are proposing to thread uh, the path uh, through, through that tree so that we can stay as far away from the other good trees as possible. Um, this yellow wood, and again, if you can go forward two slides, this yellow wood is actually within, it, it's, uh, yellow wood trees are um, medium to small understory trees that grow um, underneath other, other trees as far as their, their um, understory. Um, but this tree, in fact, is very narrow because it has so limited access to light. Um, so the tree itself isn't as good as the others. Um, and we felt that this was the one in creating this circuit path that would be the one that we would um, need to take out. This is the tree that was the new, was new information to us that it needed to be removed when we took the design from the conceptual phase in through development. Um, we had a partial survey during the, during the conceptual phase and we had more to topographic survey done at the time of the development. Um, and it became clear to us that in order to make that portion of the um, park's path accessible as far as slope, that we would need to take that tree out. And then the last tree uh, shown here on this slide is the 22 inch caliper Norway maple. Again, this tree is actually right next to the sidewalk on Mass Ave. It is actually uh, also predominantly, the crown is over the sidewalk, doesn't provide shade um, directly into the park. Um, the, the head on this is, is lopsided. Again, that comes from being overplanted with the other trees that are in the park and it has predominantly grown over, over the sidewalk of Mass Ave. Um, it has significant girdling roots and is not in great condition either. Um, if you, so this is the proposal for new trees within the park. As you can see, the, when, when we show trees on our plans, the solid dots are existing trees to remain, and then trees with pluses, but we've also then highlighted them here with a little bit of blue. Um, those are our proposed trees. So we are asking for permission to take out the three trees as described. And then these are the trees that we would be putting in as replacements. Um, those consist of all native trees. If you could go ahead to the next. Um, we are proposing uh, redbud, um, yellowwood, and hawthorn, which are all native understory trees. So we'd be getting in a different level of canopy. And then as far as our canopy trees that we would be proposing, we are looking into the thornless honey locust, a uh, tulip tree, and a swamp white oak. Um, again, all native trees, those last three, the honey locust, the tulip tree, and the white oak are canopy trees um, and will uh, get full canopy and provide shade. Now, I know that there's been some discussion in throughout the town about carbon sequestration. I will acknowledge that the tree removal and then the tree planting will not be an equal carbon sequestration from the beginning. Um, trees, obviously bigger trees do sequester more um, than new trees. Uh, per our calculations, uh, we estimate that within nine years that the new trees that we would be planting would be sequestering as much as the current um, trees are today. Um, and then afterwards would start to sequester more carbon. Um, I think that's where I'll, 
I'll end our presentation. Um, we also do have a series of shrubs and ground covers also of native varieties that would be planted around the perimeter of the lawn, the lawn area being in the center and then around the perimeter having the shrubs and ground covers. And then we'll just go. Um, is that the end of your presentation? Um, okay, I guess we're going to public comment. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Lee, and I submitted a letter. Hopefully folks have gotten That's a chance to look at it. Terrific. Um, so first of all, I appreciate the efforts, the time and energy that it's been put into revitalizing Whitmore Park. It's a real treasure in the center of town. And um, I recently became aware of this proposal to remove the trees, and I became very concerned about removal of healthy trees. Um, I appreciate uh, being able to offer my perspective as a person with a disability in a wheelchair. Um, so I, I live nearby. I'm able to go by the park and utilize the park. And, 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 and I think that uh, usage of the park has increased over the past two to three years. Um, there are more. Um, arts programs, the beer garden, concerts, a variety of things where people do gather. In fact, it's been quite popular. And as somebody who uses a wheelchair, I have been able to be there and enjoy it and, um, and find it accessible. In fact, there are three entrances currently that are accessible. There are pathways. I'm all for improving accessibility for sure and taking out those bricks and you know improving things in a variety of ways. But I think, respectfully, it's one thing to look at um, design plans and pictures of trees. It's another to be in the park and to experience it. And it's a peaceful oasis. When you're there in the summer and it's getting hotter each year, um, the climate is changing and we, we need the carbon that the, um, you know, sequestration that the, the trees provide, but we also need the shade cover. And as someone with a disability, um, and also speaking for people with uh, elders, um, we often have trouble with temperature regulation, and so it's that much more important to have the shade cover to be able to reduce the heat, to, provide, to have that relief from the heat. Um, so I know that the goal is to revitalize the park and to make it more user-friendly for the residents of Arlington, but as someone, um, I would find that it, it would become too dangerous for me to use the park if we, re if we reduce the shade cover. And to, through, uh, we're talking about very tall trees. The uh, yellowwood is 30 feet tall. I've, I've been in contact with, with the tree warden. Uh, that's 30 feet tall, and the Norway maples are both 50 feet. So these are some of the tallest trees in the park that provide the most shade cover and appreciate the desire um, to plant new trees. That's important. But it would take many years, if not decades, to grow tall enough to provide adequate shade cover to, to have similar shade cover to what is provided now. So if the goal is to revitalize the park, I, I fear that in fact it will become less usable and, and it would be too risky. I mean, heat complications for people with disabilities and elders can actually be life-threatening. And I know that's not what anybody wants, but I wanted to be able to share this perspective because it's important. And um, I only recently became aware of this issue, which is why I'm here to speak up now. I'm a volunteer with the Commission on Disability, and I brought up this issue on the agenda just this past week. And we talked about it, but we, we uh, decided to talk about it in greater depth next month when we had more information and could speak more knowledgeably about it. And that's when I um, reached out and, and was in contact with, with Allie Carter and with Jenny Raid and getting more information, which I want to be able to discuss more knowledgeably um, with the commission. So I think it's important to consider this carefully, given this perspective, given these issues, because I don't think anyone wants to uh, create a negative situation we're trying to improve. Um, and, you know, as someone with a disability, I'm able to utilize the park. I'm able to enjoy it. I'm all for improvements, but I, I, if we reduce the shade cover, we not only uh, interfere with the health of the environment, but we potentially interfere with the health of the residents of Arlington um, and make the park less user-friendly. So um, I think it's important to find some way, an alternative to work around so that we preserve the trees, you know, have accessible paths, make improvements, but 
keep uppermost in mind preserving these trees because once we remove them, you know, it's going to be many, many years before we have similar shade cover um, and all the benefits and beauty that that provides. So I appreciate you hearing me out and listening to my concerns and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much. Um, and just for the record, I just want to note um, that uh, with the agenda items under this item that we have the memo from Ali Carter, the report from Crowley Cottrell, we have correspondence from Patricia Warden, Warden dated January 24th, 2020 regarding compliance with Chapter 87. We also have correspondence from Patricia Warden dated February 10th, 2020 regarding tree requests and those have already been incorporated into the record as requested. Sorry, go ahead. I should have Thank done you. that at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Rachel Stark. In addition to being Ellen's uh, mic stand, I am the founder and chair of Walking in Arlington, which is a 20-year-old walkability and pedestrian advocacy group with an email list of 700 people. We advocate for walking and walkability in Arlington and, and around Arlington. And part of walkability is having some place that's worth walking to. Otherwise, there's no point. And people, I hear all the time, people want tree-lined streets. They like walking on tree-lined streets much better than sun-blasted streets. And they want to walk to tree-shaded parks, and that's what a lot of people talk about. Mm -hmm. People of all abilities deserve walkable sidewalks and a walkable environment, but we have not done a good job with that. Just across the street from the Whittemore Park, the sidewalks are crumbling, uneven, missing bricks, I mean, nearly impassable for an able-bodied person, never mind someone in a, in a wheelchair, and that's just across the street. When we get snow, a large mounds of snow are allowed to be left on the curb cuts and on the sidewalks, and making it basically impossible to, to walk, difficult to walk and impossible to get down the sidewalks and to the park in a wheelchair. Whittemore Park is in the middle of 10 lanes of traffic. It is, it is noisy, it's full of exhaust fumes. The only thing that makes it a nice place to listen to a concert or to have a glass of beer is the mature trees. They keep it shady, they keep it cooler, they keep it a little bit quieter, they keep the air a little cleaner. That's what makes it usable and nice at all. It, it's kind of right on the line of not being usable because of it's in the middle of two huge streets. The trees keep it shady, they keep it quieter, it's nicer. If you cut down those trees, what you have is a patch of sun-blasted grass and dirt in the middle of 10 lanes of traffic. That's not a nice place to be. If we're serious about the Americans with Disabilities Act and honoring the spirit of that law, and I think we should be, we should focus on repairing and maintaining the streets and the sidewalks in and around the park, to the park, and keeping the snow and ice off the sidewalks and the curb cuts. Cutting down mature trees in the middle of town is not the right way to increase wheelchair access. It is not the right way to make a nicer park. Do not, do not plan paths through trees. Plan paths around trees. Improve the pedestrian and the wheelchair access to the park. Improve the conditions in the park, and there's plenty of ways we could do that. Existing mature trees are survivors. We know they're going to make it because they have. Um, newly planted trees, most of them die. We all know this, and, and we are not good about watering our street trees, so almost all of them die. We know that. Um, keep the trees we have. We need mm -hmm. them. They're beautiful. They make the park usable, and we need them. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I've been sort of bending the three-minute rule, but also recognizing that there's um, lots of people here for other Warren article here, so, but I'm gonna let, continue to bend it, but if, if, some, if the point, you know, if you wanna reiterate, reiterate the point, I, you can, just, go ahead. Before you press it, <laughs> I just wanna say, <clears throat> I discovered tonight that this meeting is not wheelchair accessible. I had to help Ellen through the front door because the, the button you push that opens the door doesn't work. We didn't know where the elevator was, and it's almost impossible to get through that door. So um, I know you didn't know it, I didn't know it, but that might be something, okay? Thank you. Um, I'm Joanne Preston. I live at 42 Mystic Lake Drive. Um, I'm a town meeting member 
for Precinct 9, which is, encompasses Whittemore Park. I have also, we've started a group called Friends of Arlington Trees because so many trees, large trees, shade trees have been cut down. The gas leak ones, 45 at the high school, some others that are gonna be in Broadway Plaza, and we would like to find alternatives to cutting them down. I'm gonna read this because I have some slides I wanna show. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak about the importance of preserving three healthy trees in Whittemore Park. As you know, the public response has been overwhelmingly in favor of preserving these trees. The request for cutting down these shade trees was denied at a tree hearing in which our town tree warden deemed all three trees as healthy. Um, 23 letters were asked. I hope you got them. And 12 residents took time out of work to go there. Others have written you since. The rationale for cutting down the trees was that they were in the way of a proposed new walkway, which is ADA compliant, because they all have to be. However, the planning department itself states that the new walkway was not strictly functional. Residents to cut through the park from Russell Street to the intersections of Mass Ave. That's not what it's for. It was to improve circulation within the park. Hence, the ADA compliant walkway could be anywhere in the park. It's not getting from A to B, it's just to experience the park. But unfortunately, it seems to be in the way of three healthy shade trees. I argue that design should follow function, and these trees are highly functional. Um, they collectively redo, uh, remove, it's your numbers, <laughs> Uh, 1,900 pounds of at atmospheric carbon a year at one of the heaviest traffic areas. Moreover, these large leafy shade trees cool the park for the benefit of residents and furnish relief for the newly discovered heat island, which is right next to the park. Um, I would like to note, by the way, I did look again at what you had on the internet, and it did make the point that all, if these nine trees, replacement trees, after nine years would remove as much carbon as the three healthy trees. But that's not, those aren't the right numbers because what is being moved, removed are eight trees, large trees, and uh, being replaced with, what, two inch trees, four inch trees, small trees. And so it'll take a very long time before we're able to remove that carbon. Um, since the trees need to stay where they are, you can't move the trees, they, and they continue to absorb carbon and render shade, the path can be anywhere in the park to improve circulation. Um, I'm requesting that the designers make small changes in their plan to preserve the trees. Now, you see here, you have the 2018 plan goes on one side of the yellow, uh, the yellow wood tree, a very, very special tree. It said that there was too much slope. Well, wouldn't an alternative be in a million and a half dollar project to take a few thousand dollars and just shore up that slope? I did it in my backyard for a tree. And that would allow the tree to be there. It could even be on, the, the path could even be on the other side and they could use um, recycled plastic tree crates that would protect the roots of the other tree. The other two trees uh, in this plan, you could change the opening onto the sidewalk and you would save them. I don't think it's a bad thing that one of these trees it, has a, has a function of shading the sidewalk because I think Ellen will tell you, I will tell you, it's important in last July is the hottest July we've had on in recorded history to have a shaded walk. Now, um, You're at five minutes if you could if, yeah. ask other people. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Hi, my name is Mara Vats. I live at 77 Warren Street. 
Um, thank you for your time. I know there have been a lot of um, discussions about trees. This isn't the first time and probably not the last time I'll be up here. Um, I'm here to oppose the removal of the yellow wood tree. The two Norway maples were slated for removal in the plan that was presented and accepted by town meeting, but the yellow wood was not part of that plan and we were promised that no more trees were going to be removed. Uh, the tree warden has said that it's a perfectly healthy tree, although it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing tree. I don't think that that's the purpose of trees. It is sequestering carbon and uh, providing shade, and it's a native tree, so it's supporting the ecosystem. I'm concerned that the construction of the circular path will cause significant stress to the existing trees. So some of those that are going to remain might not survive the renovation. I'm also concerned that new plantings won't survive because as far as I know, there's no long-term watering plan for this park. Um, I realize this is just one tree, but removing it as an afterthought sends the message that we're not really serious about saving trees. Uh, we're looking at the removal of 45 trees along Mass Ave for the high school rebuild and possibly 13 mature trees in the Broadway Plaza in the next few years. So I think we need to ask, ask ourselves if we really value trees even when it's inconvenient. With what we know about climate change and carbon sequestration, we cannot go on as if mature trees are disposable or easily replaceable. Every design decision must put preservation at the forefront. I don't think that ADA compliance has to be at odds with tree preservation, and Ellen spoke to that. Uh, with ingenuity and creativity, we can find solutions to these things. Regardless of the decision that the board makes for this particular tree, I hope that in future projects, Arlington can express from the outset a dedication to preserving our urban canopy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street. I'm on the tree committee, as is Mara Vats, but we're speaking as individuals. <laughs> The tree committee has not taken a vote regarding removal of any of these trees. Um, I did get up on the floor of town meeting last spring when uh, one of the town meeting members presented a motion to actually remove this project from the CPA menu of projects um, because she didn't want to see any trees cut down whatsoever. In the lead up to town meeting, m several members of the tree committee and I spoke to many of the involved parties, including the tree warden, and we felt that it was a good process. The, as the planner, person from the planning department said, they had their own arborist come and um, rate the trees in the, the uh, park as healthy or middle, middling or, or not healthy. And the tree warden agreed with that assessment except for um, two trees they thought were kind of middling. He thought they were perfectly healthy. And at the time of town meeting, those two trees were, um, the, the planners were going to remove more healthy trees. They put them back, and there were only two trees left that the town, that the tree warden thought were healthy that were going to be removed. And I felt that the tree committee was happy with the process that the tree warden was consulted as we had asked the town to start doing and all the projects. And, you know, you can't have a perfect plan. Nobody's going to be completely happy. So I got up and I advised town meeting to vote down the motion to take the CPA project off the, the list and put it on the list and vote in favor of it because we thought it was a good process. Now, there's a third tree that... Uh, is a, is was regarded as a healthy tree by the tree warden. Um, the plan, I believe the, the planning department person said that all three trees were kind of not that healthy, but the tree warden would not have had a hearing if the trees had been unhealthy. He would have just had them taken down anyway. Um, so the yellow wood is the tree that I'm objecting to. I already said the other two trees, okay, you can't win them all. But to add a third tree that's perfectly healthy... Um, without really there being any input, and I understand that there wasn't a final plan on the floor of town meeting, I get that. But I do agree with the other speakers that the general proposition that we need to have as many trees as we possibly can have in town, and this is a very important public space, 
I just, I read somewhere that, I don't know the actual reason why the yellowwood tree had to be removed, but it might have had something to do with an uh, uh, accessible ramp. And it just seems like there's gotta be some way to do it and keep that tree. So I would like to advocate for um, denying the appeal on the, um, the uh, I would ask the select board that I'm okay with them um, up, um, Denying, what am I asking for? The, 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 the planning department apparently appealed the denial of the removal of the trees because of the objections. The denial of the two trees that were before town meeting um, last year could probably be reversed. It would be consistent with what's already happened in town, but I would um, hope that you would uphold the denial of the yellowwood tree. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Clarissa Rowe. I'm at 137 Herbert Road. I'm a registered landscape architect, 675. <laughs> and I'm raising um, my voice to say, this plan is a wonderful plan. And I've lived in town for a long time. Wasn't born here, but I've lived here a long time. And I'm old. I like shade. And I'm somewhat disabled, so I spend a lot of time under trees. <laughs> um, we are, I think, it's too bad the plan is not up. There are a lot of circles on that plan. There's a lot of shade trees still there. I'm very worried that this, and I'm, I've been taking care of Arlington's trees for a long time. Mike knows I'm a pain in the butt, is a nice way of saying it. Um, but I, you know, there's a beautiful London plain tree on Mill Street um, that I've been, saving every time there's a new manager of that building. <laughs> um, this is a precedent-setting decision. We need to improve our spaces, whether it's this space, which has really been a not a common, not a space. Yes, people have come there in the last couple of years because of Allie's wonderful programming of the space. This plan that this wonderful landscape architect has done We'll transform it. We'll make it a place. And we landscape architects talk with our hands. We're sorry, but that's what we do. Um, it will make it a wonderful place, a real destination with a lot of trees. But by saying that every single project that comes to this town has to not touch a tree is a mistake. And it's a mistake to say the high school can't be built because some trees are coming down. We know that's not going to happen. Let's be practical. Let's, I think, I think it's a very good idea to be planting small trees because they grow faster. We could, of course, say, you know, this is an equal caliper inch to cal caliper inch, but those trees won't do well. They don't do little trees do well in a public situ situation. And actually, the DPW does water their new trees, and they do a fine job of it. And I think that this is an opportunity to make a really beautiful space in Arlington, and I urge you not to do a precedent-setting vote to not take down the three trees. There are many opinions about whether the trees are in good shape or not. The two Norway maples are on the invasive list. They don't count in a way. And the yellowwood, I think, is not a specimen tree. You're gonna get some really beautiful specimen trees, and I urge you to support the plan and vote down the idea of taking down the three trees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Warden. And thank you for your wonderful presentation on behalf of the disabled people who um, like to use the park. Um, Arlington is fortunate to have a treasure in its center early 19th century antique house and a tiny forest with healthy shaped trees. But the trees are, have been neglected. They are endangered by our planning department and their chosen landscape firm who want to eliminate them. Many Arlingtonians came to the tree warden's hearing, all except one. 
uh, who happened to be a member of the tree committee, pleaded for preservation of the trees, all of them, that, that one. The landscape was get rid of shade trees attitude is tragic. As we all know, trees help stop climate change, purify our air, clean our water, and provide climate resiliency. Irresponsible removal of shade trees is in violation of Arlington's official hazard mitigation plan, which recommends them for this and other areas along the commercial corridors. Shade trees provide natural outdoor air conditioning. Health hazards to seniors by heat island at the site would occur if these trees are removed. We have several hundred low-income senior residents Residences within walking distance of the site, Chestnut Manor, Windsor Char, Cusack Terrace, Millbrook Apartments, from whom the new landscape plan is unhelpful in many ways, including removal of appropriate seating and a path which makes it more difficult to reach point, a, from point B from point A. Ignoring this, the planners have chosen <coughs> to recommend that the lucrative landscaping contract of $1,500,000 for the tree cutting plan must be funded partly, firstly, by CPA funding under the auspices of historic preservation, which is bogus, it's not historic preservation. Um, that money could have been used instead for many, many um, projects to help the homeless um, uh, and for uh, cleaning out Japanese knotwood and their bike way and Millbrook. Uh, secondly, the planning department wants to use $125,000 of federal HUD CDBG funding designed for low-income residents for this project, but this project will only hurt these seniors. The Director of Public Works has said that the town itself could do the basic work necessary for less than $17,000. The trees do not belong to the Chamber of Commerce. They do not belong to the Planning Department. They do not belong to the town manager. They belong to all of us, <coughs> including our seniors, our children, and grandchildren. Please, we hope you, our select board, will make sure they remain for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Warren. Hi, my name's Lynette Calderhouse. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, I'm reading a statement on behalf of one of our low-income disabled residents whose voice pro probably was not considered in the planning of this project. Um, I'm making a statement partially, uh, wait. Um, as, as I understand it, there are alternative suggestions to achieve ADA compliance while keeping those trees intact. As a disabled individual who supports disability accommodations, I am in full support of any alternative solution that will allow ADA compliance while still enabling tree conservation. To clarify my understanding of these issues, I work as both a volunteer and paid consultant for the Boston Center for Independent Living, the Boston metro area's foremost disability advocacy group. As a journalist and health blogger, I write for national publications on living with disability. However, my de graduate degree is in the environmental sciences. I work for environmental nonprofits as well as for the town of Wellesley as their environmental education coordinator. In recent years, I turned much of my focus on the intersection of environmental conservation, sustainability, and health. I have a rare connective tissue disease. Eilers Danlos Syndrome. One of my many symptoms includes the inability to properly regulate my body temperature. And in warmer weather, I am prone to heat intolerance. As an apartment dweller, I do not have the privilege of easy access to a yard to enjoy tree cover and fresher air. I am fortunate to live close to Spy Pond. I am fortunate, too, to live in a town that overall values and maintains its trees. When I go for walks during warmer seasons, I can find more shade cover while walking, and the trees help create beneficially cooler microclimates. This is even more crucial for those of us of lower income who do not have access to or can't afford air conditioning <coughs> or running it often. This is something to consider, as well as the town mills over densifying the area. 
but also diversifying its population to be more inclusive of minorities and those with lower income as well as disabled people. It's easier for homeowners with yards and central air conditioning to speak about urbanizing an area when they can insulate themselves from the adverse health impacts that often occur with density and urbanization. Those of us who need to live in apartments are often without yards or air conditioning. We need to rely on our immediate surrounding environment for those benefits. And if they don't exist, we suffer. I know this intimately and painfully as someone who has had to be rushed to the hospital in summer and watch family members get ill and pets die in the heat because of lack of relief. As one peer review paper on the subject of temperature related illness noted, higher rates of heat related morbidity and mortality occur in city dwellers who reside on the top floors of apartment buildings or who do not have access to air conditioning. The urban heat island effect refers to patterns of city development, such as replacing trees with concrete surfaces, that cause urban areas to retain heat throughout the evening in comparison to suburban and rural area. As it noted in Yale University's Climate Con Connections, climate change disproportionately threatens the health of vulnerable groups. According to the 2016 Climate and Health Assessment, vulnerable groups include those with low income, some communities of color, immigrant groups, older adults, persons with disabilities, and persons with pre-existing or chronic medical conditions. I hope you will take these factors into consideration when making your final decision. We can improve our town so it's both ADA compliant and conserves the trees and other, um, trees that disabled and other vulnerable groups need for their health and to keep our climate in check. Thank you so much. Beth Malofchek, 20 Russell Street, um, town meeting member. I am the town meeting member that attempted to get town meeting to act like Congress a year ago and shut the purse to offer an opportunity for a re-examination of the objectives of this particular plan. I respectfully ask the members of the select board to give serious consideration to this precedent-setting decision so that all projects that come before you concerning public land, land under your control as the select board, land for which CPA funds, town funds, or federal funds would be used, first and foremost, consider the tree canopy. After the hottest summer on record, and certainly having watched what happened in Australia and the many things that we're all aware of, it's incumbent upon us, and I don't have children. I'm up here because of your children and your grandchildren. It is incumbent upon us, and I respectfully ask you, again, to consider the precedent-setting decision. Any project that comes before you, first and foremost, we need to consider, are you preserving and fortifying the tree canopy? And if you are going to minimize it, to what degree and why? So it appears one of the main objectives of this plan is to create a lawn. And again, with the heat we're facing, with the lawn at Uncle Sam Plaza, due to the unfortunate demise of the Heritage Maple, with the lawn at Town Gardens with the beautifully restored fountain, why do we need this additional lawn? It seems a little redundant. This is a beautiful park now for the shade it provides. It's been neglected. Many spots in town are like that. I understand there are decisions that need to be made where you spend the money. So I would like to remind everyone that a year ago at town meeting, again, it was made, this plan it was described as envisioning the creation of a lawn. It was stated there are four trees that have to come out because they are dead or unhealthy. Those have already been taken out. We were told, and this is a statement and I'll quote it, it was at an hour, three minutes on May 8th, I'm quoting the chair of the CPA. I've been assured by the town manager that there are no plans to remove trees for this project beyond those that the tree warden has already designated for removal that need to go anyway. So I ask you 
to please not further diminish the tree canopy when we need it for your children and your grandchildren, for everybody in this room, for people who enjoy using the park now, for people who want to be able to get out of their homes and apartments during the summer when it's hot. I like to get out of my house and my apartment. And I would also ask you, I hope you will reconsider the plan. I hope you will reconsider the choice of honey locust. Because anyone who is familiar with Arlington Center knows we've got ailing and dying honey locust along that stretch of Mass Ave, on both sides of, Ma of, on both sides of Mass Ave, right facing the park. Uh, Russell Parking, or railroad parking and Russell Parking are filled with honey locust, not doing particularly well. Buzzle Field, it's all honey locust. Please ask the tree warden how many honey locusts we have in town, and please consider um, catalpa and other true canopy trees, true majestic trees, but I hope you don't cut out any trees in this park. I didn't intend to speak tonight, but I felt it, it was important, so thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Beth. Okay. <coughs> I guess I'll, unless there's anything else, Ms. Carter or Mr. Chaplain, I'll, you know, take questions, comments from my colleagues. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I thought that was just that one was eight. Oh, okay, sorry. Good evening, Elizabeth Gray on Jason Street. I also um, was here to attend and not speak but um, on this issue, but this uh, really speaks to me. Um, I agree that this is a precedent-setting decision, but the precedent that I would like Arlington to set is that Arlington values trees and tree canopy over perfectly circular paths, and that Arlington does not remove trees even trees like Norway maples, because they're inconveniently located. And I would also like to say that as far as carbon sequestration goes, every tree counts. Every tree is important, even Norway maples. I also agree that the goal is to make that a, a, a wonderful place for the town. I took my kids there after getting ice cream at Chili Cow. They'd run across the railroad tracks. We'd sit on the bench and hopefully lick the ice cream before it all melted all over us. What makes that a wonderful place is the people gathering. It's families, it's people with picnics, it's the great beer garden, but people are not gonna go there and bake in the sun. That is not what's gonna make it a wonderful place. It's the people wanting to gather there um, in the shade and not a perfectly circle path. And one more comment before I sit down is that I was just talking to a friend before I came and she related to me um, that what she would say is that she grew up and her father was in a, a wheelchair for most of his life. And she says, I'll tell you how hard it is to push a wheelchair. I've done that. I've fought that all my life. But my, my father would say, keep the tree. He would rather have a tree and sit in the shade than a perfectly smooth path. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> and I would like to... And I'll forward this on to the select board office so they can be notified. We did receive letters from um, residents who couldn't be here tonight in opposition to the planned, the plan that includes removal of these three trees. Uh, we have Bill Berkowitz. We have Nancy Bloom uh, with her opposition. We have Anthony Jones and Tamara Chenoweth Jones um, who strongly protest the planned removal of these three trees. We have Lara Kiesel, um, who also opposes this. It cites Whitt Whittemore Trees and Disabilities. We have um, letter opposition from Claire Odom. We also have strong objections to the removing of the trees by Robert P. Murray, Esquire. Um, we have correspondence, um, again, in opposition to the removal of the three trees from June Ratowski, Jeff, and Eleanor Freed. We have several pieces of correspondence from Joan U. Smeltzer um, say, asking us to support preserving the trees and not removing them. Uh, and we have a correspondence from James, sorry, Jane Whittemore, um, uh, again in opposition, as well as a letter of opposition to, from Montserrat Zuckerman. They will be entered in since they couldn't be here tonight and we'll contact them and let them know. Okay. Um, any comments, questions, Mr. Dunn? Oh. Um, okay. Um, 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about, I wonder, uh, about some of the history about uh, trees and how we've thought about them in Arlington. Just in a, speaking just from the last few years while I've been on the select board, when I think about when, uh, I, when I started here, we had a part-time uh, tree warden and we didn't really have tree hearings. Trees would just come down. It was the way, it was, the pra it was as a matter of practice. When it was time, when someone wanted a tree to come down, it pretty much just happened. And uh, we changed that process through a series, in, in some ways, in many ways, we didn't actually even change the law or the bylaws, we just started applying them. Because the bylaw says there will be a tree hearing, and so we started saying, okay, let's actually do the tree hearing. And uh, I think that that in itself has really changed the way that Arlington is thinking about trees because we actually, like, because when we take one down, we actually talk about it now as opposed to it actually <coughs> coming, coming down. I think the second thing I'd point out is, or think about, it's important to think about, is how Arlington has changed its attitude about replanting. And our budget for tree planting has gone up, uh, like, I, I mean, I've got this little sketch in front of me, but it's like, I don't know, a factor of five, a factor of four, something like that over, over the last five years, as we've appreciated that there was a period of time where we were taking more trees down than we were putting in. And we have reversed that. And for the last several years, we have been putting more trees into the ground than we have been taking down. And yes, there's age issues, and like you can't replace a, a, a mature tree with a baby tree, and, but at the same time, uh, and I'm not trying to exactly make that argument, but I am making the argument that we've been a lot more thoughtful about it. And the, uh, and the third thing is, uh, a third big change is, is not just did we talk about the trees, but we've uh, instituted a lot of process around them. Uh, as I think someone had mentioned earlier, uh, involving what is now a full-time tree warden in the town's plan from an early stage such that trees are more likely to be preserved. And uh, so to me, when I get to this, so I, for me, when I think about it, uh, and how many tree hearings have we had in the last few years? Way more than we used to, but still not that many. And how many trees have we taken down? And the answer is not that many. But we, um, we've saved many by simply having the process. We've saved a few by uh, denying uh, the, the appeals. But that said, I do have a practical approach to this. I don't think that every tree is the, needs to be saved. I don't think that every tree is worth saving. And I do think that there really are practical applications. And I think the trees can be taken down and, and uh, be replaced. And I'm, I'm satisfied that we have looked at these trees, that the planning department and, the, and our landscape architect have looked at this and have been careful about their, uh, how they're addressing the, the trees and the use of trees and the replacement of trees um, here in town. And so I, I, I don't have a, I will love the tree canopy. There's still going to be a tree canopy over this. And not only that, the tree canopy is going to be expanded with some of these new ones. And I think, that, which also takes me to kind of my fourth point, which is, uh, I really believe this project, that when we're done, it's going to be a better place. We're going to have a better park. And I think that sometimes uh, change is scary, and sometimes change is hard, but it, sometimes, but it helps to, when, you can, when one can look past the change and say, what is it that we're going to get to? And I think that we are going to get to a better park uh, through these changes. For, so for all those reasons, I move that we grant the appeal and permit the three trees to be taken down. Motion by Mr. Dunn. Is there a second for discussion or? A second for discussion. Okay. Second by Mr. Carroll or an, an additional motion? Oh, second for discussion okay. first because mm -hmm. I, I have some questions. Mr. Carroll? Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you everyone who's uh, spoke, spoken on this and thank you for all of the, the work and the, the memo and the, the presentation on this. Um, <clears throat> So I, I did go down to the park yesterday, and as everybody knows, yesterday was a beautiful day. I went down about one o'clock in the afternoon, and um, <clears throat> I, w I went down. Th the, the streets were full of people at, at that time. So I went down to look at the trees, but the first thing I noticed was I was all alone in that park when I first went in. Um, it's, it's really... I, I, it really underscored for me the need for this project um, to, to, to um, uh, revitalize the, the, the park itself. Eventually, there was one gentleman who sat down for a couple of minutes. He seemed to be kind of watching me because I was walking around looking at the map of the thing and looking at the trees, and I think he was trying to figure out what I was doing. 
Um, and then there were two women who, who did eventually come <coughs> right at the edge. They, they sat down on, on um, uh, one of the, the first benches when you entered in, uh, which incidentally, I don't believe um, they were outside of the tree canopy. There's a little piece that's, that's within the, the, um, the tree canopy. So I looked at the I looked at the trees in, in question, and it's obviously it's a little bit hard to visualize at this time of year because they don't have the the um, the leaf cover. But I, I did just as a layperson, I was struck that the the Norway maples they really lopped off, or the branches have almost all come off on the park side of those two Norway, Norway maples. So most of the benefit from those are clearly to the sidewalk um, and allowing this plan to go through actually allows anyone who's cutting that corner to actually cut right through the park, which is not an option that they really have right now. There is no entrance on Myst Mystic Street to, to cut directly across um, to, to, um, to uh, Mass Ave. So I think <clears throat> from that perspective, I think my sentiments veer towards a, a couple of the speakers who said that they could see the Norway maples, the invasives, um, the, the, the sense in, in allowing them to come out. And I think in the interest of having a more usable park where people can actually get in and access the tree canopy that is there, will be there. I think that that's, that's great. But I, I did have a few questions on the, the other. We had some information in the memo about the alternatives that were looked at around rerouting the path for the yellow wood. We had some suggestions that were presented by one of the speakers. I, I was wondering, through you, Madam Chair, could, could you speak a little bit to the, the, the various options that were considered or that could be considered um, uh, to, to avoid? Absolutely. So we did look at um, having the path go on either side of the yellow wood. Mm -hmm. um, so the the lower path would require retainage it would re require changing of grade if we were to make that section um, accessible now the other thing that was a concern with going on the lower side of that yellow wood is that we were we would not only be close to the yellow wood but we would also be close to the red maples along old mystic the pedestrian mm -hmm. way that we would be getting very close to them as well Mm -hmm. So we looked then at the other side, the uphill side of the Yellowwood, which then actually gets quite close to, again, a really nice Yellowwood, which is more of a specimen because it is more out in the open and has a fuller crown. And it gets closer to the, the two best trees in the park, which are the two pin oaks. So to, to slice the path closer um, uphill to the Yellowwood, in our, in our opinion, was going to be more harmful to the best trees in the park, the yellow wood and the two pin oaks. Um, so when we look at the canopy of the yellow wood that we're suggesting to take out, you can actually see that it is actually underneath other canopy. It's underneath the canopy of its, of its fellow yellow wood and it's underneath the canopy of the red maple that's adjacent. That was a question. That was, Madam Chair. That was actually my next question because you mentioned that that it's an, an undergrowth tree. So yes. my question is, how much is the yellow wood itself contributing to the net shade within that area? The yellow wood itself actually doesn't provide that yellow wood doesn't provide much shade to the area at all because again there Under. is other canopy over top of it. The yellow wood that is next to it, which we deem more valuable because it is out in the open, provides its own shade because it doesn't have the the red maples over top of it. Okay. So we wanted to stay away from that one and also away from the the red maples by putting the path right through the center of that rather than splitting it on either side. And do you consider it vital to have that, that segment beyond the bench, between the bench and um, Jefferson Cutter House, have that section of path there as part of the plan? Yes, I think that it's really important actually to provide a way in which to engage people who are coming up from the parking lot 
to be able to engage the park. Okay. If we didn't have that section, they would then be going across the whole entire um, front of the Cutter House okay. or would go all the way down to Mass Ave in order to be able to get into the park. So as far as, as best practices of park design, having circuits that are um, that are pathways where you don't have dead ends mm -hmm. um, are of a real value. So we see that as being part of a loop um, that really provides a lot of um, circulation and connectivity to all the different areas in the park. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciated the, the information on the carbon uh, sequestration um, and how long it would take to match and then, and then um, exceed the current carbon sequestration from the three trees. By my, uh, my math, I think we have 42 in caliper inches removed and 23 inches, I think, replaced. How long would, would it take for that number to um, so that's know. the that's within the roughly the nine years. That's also within the nine so years. So the the other thing about the sequestration that sorry that sorry the the canopy the the caliper inches uh, is a seventeen year um, where okay. it would get to be. The the thing about the carbon sequestration is that we actually gave the trees that are there the yellow wood and the two Norway maples. We actually gave them the, the by our calculations what a perfectly healthy, totally and completely full canopied 22 inch Norway maple and standing out in the middle of a field, what that would have. And so we're actually giving it a lot of credit. I think if you went through and you actually did an even more detailed survey of the existing trees and you gave it a percentage reduction based on the actual health and size of the exact, of the tree that's there, it would, it would actually, show that the current carbon sequestration is not as great as we're giving it credit for. But, but we do, like I said, we, we acknowledge that it would take nine years for the trees that we're proposing to match that calculation. Okay, great, thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Hart? I had similar talking points and questions, Mr. Caro, so I'll try not to duplicate. I went out there today, again, Similar introductory story, Mr. Cario moves today. It was 60 degrees, it was beautiful. Similar experience, I was the only one in the park. Um, I, I took a look at these couple trees, particularly first I looked at the Norway maples, and one of them looks like half a tree. And mm -hmm. it's you know, bending out mm -hmm. over the Mass Ave. It has some, I'm no tree expert, but some onerous looking branches that go right all over to the lanes of traffic that look like they could be potentially hazardous in the future. And the other one too, it just it, both of them seem to bend away from the park. I don't think they contributed too much to the aesthetics of the park or the shade. My concerns and I think a lot of the concerns that we heard from residents were the yellowwood tree. And so I think you spoke to this but what would be, I guess one question initially is how close can you dig a path next to a tree and consider it safe for an existing tree? So that really depends on how you dig next to it. There are lots of ways to protect existing root structures of trees, yep. but typically five times the diameter of the tree is where there aren't any viable roots. So what we're planning on doing throughout the park, regardless of whether these trees come out or not, is root pruning, air spading and root pruning along the edge of where the path would be going anyway. And what that does, and those are best practices in arboriculture currently, is that it carefully removes the soil around the existing root structure, and then it allows for the root structure to be cleanly cut and then you can excavate to put in a path. And the reason why that clean cut is so important is that if you come in there with a machine or even with hand tools without cutting cleanly, so the root pruning it's called, without pruning the sides, you can pull out roots that rip back to the tree. So best, best practices is to blow away gently with uh, the air spade itself and cut along the edge so that you have a clean cut. We're planning on doing that um, 
As far as how close you can get to the tree, it really depends on the tree itself. Okay. So as we looked at the plan, when I was out there today, it was clear to go to the right wouldn't be feasible because of the drop in grade and it would land you in the, in the stairs. stairs. Right. And that just wouldn't work. That's right. So was it considered and for what reason was it ruled out to go to the left side of that tree? So that's where we get into it's the pear yellow, the, the, its friend, the other yellow wood that's okay. right next to it. And the concern there was do we want to put two yellow woods under stress by threading the needle between the two? Mm -hmm. Or would we like to give the one that is a fuller head, headed canopy is in better condition? The current, the, the yellow wood that we are um, proposing to take out also has a, um, has crotch rot um, where the main leaders split off from the center and you can actually put your hand into it and, and it's actually rotting. The other tree doesn't have this condition. It is a healthier tree. So we, we want to give that more of a chance to succeed. So by pulling it away far further, that's really what we're trying to do. Rather than, than compromising two trees, we would like to give that one the best chance of becoming even, even more of a specimen tree. So the companion yellowwood, is, is that the tree to the left? That's right. That's the tree and directly is to it its left. Much to, just because I don't know how to identify a tree. Is it larger? The it's larger and it has a much fuller and rounder canopy because it's not competing against the, the shade of the red maple that is on the side. Because as I looked at this tree, it looked like, I guess I'd call it a roof, it had a roof on top of it with the four trees around it. That's right. Whereas, I mean, I wouldn't want to take out a healthy tree, regardless of whether or not it has any, you know, it, it, whether or not it contributes to the canopy, just because, you know, we have a lot of residents who care very much about these trees. But the answer here, I think, is, you know, in order to achieve this plan, if leaving this tree is going to put other trees at risk, then, you know, I think it's a tough decision, but it's certainly want, you know, a major consideration, that decision. This plant, I, I've loved this plan since, you know, the first time I saw it. I think this greatly, greatly enhances the usability of the Whittemore Park. Anyone that's been to the beer garden knows that if you don't get there early, then you don't get a good seat at the, at the beer garden and this will help expand the space and create a lot more use and allow for bigger events which <coughs> will attract more artists to the space. So. Mr. DeVorsi. Yeah, thank you Madam Chair. Um, just a few comments and, and I, I start with the, the plan itself and then I'll get to the three trees but um, as was mentioned by one of the speakers earlier there was a motion at town meeting last year to remove this plan and, and town meeting voted 199 to 15 against it. So it was overwhelming support uh, in, in town meeting for, for the plan itself. And the two Norway maples were contemplated at that time to be removed. Um, so it's, as the speakers have said, it really comes down to the, to, to the yellow wood. And on your diagram of tree quality, the six healthiest trees are on either side of the, um, of the path. So if you went to the east um, in, on top of slope uh, conditions, um, th there's a possibility that you could harm those trees from what you said. If you went to the west, um, just as, as, as you just spoke. So I think you, you sit here, no one wants to cut down a healthy tree, but there are trade-offs that have to be made. And I think given the overwhelming acceptance uh, of this plan, I'm, I'm inclined to support it. But the other thing I want to mention, um, it hasn't come up a lot, but we, we started, at least on this plan, there are 15 trees within phase one in front of the, the, um, the cutter house. Um, three would be removed. This, that, that leaves 12 trees, and, and I understand there are, that there are some issues, um, particularly on the one on Mass Ave, that might actually affect the shade the most because it's facing, it's the first tree that, that from, from the west. Um, the Norway maple on Mystic Street actually is in the shade of a, another tree that's further up on Mystic Street that while it impedes onto the sidewalk, it provides a lot of shade and that's being kept. So I, I, I see that as a, as a positive thing. Um, 
you know, there, there, there are difficult trade-offs that, that, that you had to make, but I, th I think this incorporates the plan. I don't um, see that there, the statement last year that there were no plans not to remove any trees should be held against the speaker or, or, or the town manager uh, who, who had information at that time that suggested that the path could go just to the east of, of, of the, uh, the Yellowwood we're talking about. So while it's difficult, um, I think looking, looking at everything here, I'm inclined to support this as well. Okay. And um, one of the benefits and sometimes disadvantages of being a chair is sometimes all your points get made, and sometimes more than once. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with it. The one that I really wrestled with um, was the Yellowwood. Um, I was down there on Sunday after might have been the same event. Mr. Yeah. Carroll left, um, made the same observations, and, and that was the one I really need to listen to, listen to the residents and the citizens. Um, and for me, what it falls down to is um, looking at the uh, professionals who know far more than I do, who are to my left, but also to my right, um, and, and really be guided by that. So um, with that, if there's any more questions. Just oh, one Mr. question. DeCourse, yeah. sorry. Just one thing on, on the tree diagram there's a tree that's circled here, and this might have been earlier that's on mass ave closest to the corner of mystic street there's no tree there but it's it's right here uh, and it's outside the park yeah. but there's no tree there so is that um i believe well last i was up there well, there's a tree there there was not a tree there's not right. a tree in that picture. which is going to be replaced okay all right i, I yeah, maybe i'm I, I miscounted but i thought if, if it wasn't there, I was going to suggest that that, that, that uh, I'm sure is going to be replaced as well because you have it here. Um, sorry for that. No, no. Um, the, it's a good clarification. So no further comments or questions on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kira. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We now go to agenda item nine. An update on our water sewer rate changes to mitigate the MWO, MWRA debt shift from our town manager. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. So as the board recalls, several months ago, uh, we had a conceptual discussion with the board and the director of public works, and I believe the deputy town manager, about various scenarios, various scenarios we could consider uh, for increasing water sewer rates to then reduce the water sewer debt shift in potentially in proportion or not in proportion with the new debt that would be rolling on in relation to the high school. So what we, do you want me to wait a moment? Or? Well, maybe yeah. you yeah, just yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah, Madam Chair, while we wait, mm -hmm. may I open a window? Oh, definitely. definitely. As long as I don't have to do it, I have the worst luck. And the worst luck. Okay, he just goes right up. Let me try and give these to you. Thank you. These they all spoke, so I'm just going to recycle them. Say not all the windows in this room work. No. Yeah. Oh. See, that's uh, so. right. Feels good to me. I'm sorry for my benefit. Can you start over? Of course. I totally course. my Absolutely. fault. No, no, please, please. Ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, as the board may recall, uh, I think it was several months ago now. Um, myself, Director of Public Works, Deputy Town Manager, had a discussion with the board about rolling back the MWRA debt shift, needing to consider requisite increases in the water sewer rates, uh, and tying that rollback, or potent, either tying or not tying that rollback in the debt shift to the amount of debt that would be rolling on from the, uh, the high school project. So what we wanted to do tonight was show you some scenarios. We now know what the debt will be that will hit the tax rate this January from the high school, that borrowing has gone out and we have those actual debt service figures. So we wanted to walk through 
some of the possibilities uh, tonight, and then based on your feedback, questions, concerns, what have you, come back at the next meeting and ask the board to take action on the water sewer rates ba based on what it seems like or feels like the board would like to pursue. So the board has a memo before them, uh, and I'll just quickly walk across uh, the table that's in that memo uh, just to explain what each one reflects. So uh, current FY20 rates, you can see what the average um, household bill is on an annual basis, on a quarterly basis, and what the, uh, what the rate increase was. The board had already voted the 7.5% rate increases for FY20. <coughs> the next is what the Director of Public Works anticipates that he would need to be asking for for FY21 outside of the dis uh, discussion about the water sewer debt shift. So we were looking at a 5% water rate increase and a 4% sewer rate increase. Moving to the next column, we start looking at rolling back the MWRA debt shift 20% at a time, which could be then rolled off over a five-year period. The next 25% reduction could be rolled off over a four-year period, or a 33% reduction, which could be rolled off over a three-year period. So there would be that corresponding increase in either those five, four, or three-year increments. What the final column uh, shows is if we took the full amount of debt that's going to hit the tax rate this December and rolled that off the debt shift. So that amount is $2,865,980. $2,865,980. That equates to just about a 50% reduction in the, in the MWRA debt shift. Under this plan, presumably, <coughs> If the board was to choose this plan, we would then wait to see what the next increment was in the following year, the year following that, and then they just continue to take it in the chunks as they come from the debt service. Uh, so you can, I should add to be clear, so in the 20%, 25%, 33%, and then the full debt reduction scenarios, the 5% water rate increase and 4% sewer rate increase that the Director of Public Works projects we would need absent the MWRA debt shift, is incorporated into those numbers. So those numbers are all comprehensive or fully, fully loaded, so to speak. The only other thing um, that's worth mentioning is all of these figures assume that, we, um, that usage <coughs> levels off at 1,210,000 CCFs per year, which is based on the trends we've been seeing over the past couple years. However, more recently, uh, the director has noticed the trend is downward a little bit, down towards 1,150,000 a year. We don't yet know if that, that trend is going to stick or if that's a new trend, uh, but just want to put that out there in full disclosure. But we've looked at it, and we don't think that in any case we would have to come back for a mid-year rate increase, but it could mean that in the next year things change as opposed to how, we, how we're seeing them right now. So with that said, I'll stop talking uh, and hear, hear what you have to say but I hope this provides you some food for thought about how to, how to proceed. Mr. Jones? So um, I just want to state something that I think we all know, but it's worth saying, is, which is that the amount of money that is going to be paid by the taxpayers and water users of Arlington under this is the, is the same. It's a matter of which bill they're, they're, they're paying on. So this isn't about... Um, whether or not we're spending more money, this is about how we're paying for the things we've already decided that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I definitely, uh, and so yeah, so I, and I think that's just really, that's a really important point for us to, you know, think and people at home who are watching us just to say, this isn't about how, like, we, yes, we're talking about raising the water bill, but we're also talking about lowering the tax bill uh, by the, the a corresponding amount. It, I or leveling, like neutralizing yeah. tax increases. That, yes, reducing to, yeah, the, but the, with the net being the out of pocket, the same. Though right. in this world, if you're using a lot more water, you are going to experience more, and if you use less water, you're going to enjoy the benefit of this change more. Um, I definitely lean towards things to the right-hand side, um, doing it faster. Um, I could <coughs> go along with a quarter, but I'm more on a third or the full. And I will say that, frankly, my motivate, one of my big motivations here is I would like for it to be done well in advance of the next override conversation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd and then Mr. Kiro. It might be an obvious question, but when we had this discussion before, I, 
you know, one of the options we talked about was doing it over two years, which is not here. I mean, this is just a comparison sheet, but um, I thought, and I, like Mr. Dunn said, I think we, it was general consensus that we didn't want to hit everyone at once with the debt shift, but, you know, I thought we'd come close to a consensus on around two years. So I would say probably three years is really in the wheelhouse, but I assume a two-year reduction is also an option. So the challenge is going to be, we're looking at it today, I don't think we're going to borrow the same amount of money next year as we mm -hmm. borrowed this year for the high school project. So there probably won't be that same ma you know, matching or even near that $2.8 million to close off. We may borrow some more, uh, but not that full amount. Okay. Um, well, I think in these scenarios, I, then I would lean towards the 33% as the target figure. Mr. Carroll. Uh, I'm a, I, actually, I don't think we've been being asked for a vote, mm -hmm. just, just for our feedback, right? Yeah, feedback, sure. totally. Yes. But uh, I also lean towards the 33%. Um, you know, that band between 20 and 33, as far as the average bill over three months, it's very, very small. That's a, it's a narrow uh, band. I think a 33% makes sense also following Mr. Dunn's logic because we're one year in now on a four-year plan. So I feel that we have a um, responsibility actually to complete this by the end of the four-year plan. And... Um, the, the rolling off the Correct. the um, yeah. debt shift, so I think that 33 percent probably is the one that um, that gets us there. And um, while we're discussing this, though, I would just remind us all, and I know we nobody forgot that we did discuss um, when it comes around time for rate setting, though, establishing a a water sewer discount program. P probably means tested, but for our um, um, uh, seniors, and so we're going to want to figure out how we want to offset the increases that are in here. Um, when I look at this, you know, for average Arlington home use, you know, it's 90 bucks over over what it would otherwise be with no offset change. So that might be something to think about when when we're coming to rate setting time, putting together scenarios around that would be my my thinking about what the impact would be and what our um, expected um, participation might be, maybe based on participation rates and other programs for like around a $90 disc annual discount or something like that. It's just a thought. Mr. Duke, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, and I'm comfortable as well with the 33% the and, and getting through this in, in the time period that Mr. Dunn raised before the next uh, potential override. Um, and, I, and I will say, just to reiterate, because I think it's important, uh, again, to say what this is, is it's taking money that was included within the tax rate and moving it over or taking it back to water rates because it was shifted to, to, the, to the tax rate. So it's essentially revenue neutral, but it's, it's all going back to rate payers um, as opposed to, to being in property taxes. And we had discussed earlier because of changes in the tax laws, the benefits of putting it on the tax bills are no longer uh, around. Um, and so for that reason and also for the reason that people can, can control consumption um, of, of their water bills to, to a degree. Um, but this would also be brought back to, in addition to taxable users, there are exempt organizations that pay water bills, so it's bringing them back, um, and they'll be paying uh, the, the full amount as well. Okay. Um, I agree on the 33% in terms of what we've outlined in terms of getting things done over the next four years, and I, I do want to commend the town manager and others um, because when we last embarked on the campaign, a lot of people were talking about how different bills were hitting and assessments and you know, and they were saying, don't you people think when these things are happening, you know, um, in the future, you know, why do you, it's like an onslaught and then there's sort of a quiet time and, you know, couldn't you kind of temp temper it over um, so that, you know, if a hit comes in, some relief comes in at the same time. And, and that's more easier said than done. Um, it, you know, it takes long running financial planning and the finance committee and uh, the town manager and deputy town manager. And I know 
Um, I've seen the amount of hours that have gone into that, and, and but also keep it livable and sustainable um, in terms of uh, what people have to pay um, here in Arlington. And I really do appreciate. Um, I know we've all sat individually at these meetings to actually see that it's you know it's a level lane versus yep. you know it's it's when everything converges that way. So um, yes, the community is paying more and is committed to um, the, the town of Arlington, but we definitely took up those remarks to heart um, and, and came up with this. But I just wanted to acknowledge that it wasn't just sort of putting a formula into a matrix and, and hitting a button. It was a really a lot of um, co uh, conversations as well as what we have asked you for, which you gave us the, the four different options. So um, I would agree with the 33%, I'd rather, um, get it done within the framework that we've committed um, to the voters. And um, if my only caveat would be if for some reason these numbers, there's any kind of wide variance and they change <coughs> in some way, which I don't see, um, I think you're certainly getting the sentiments of the board for an agenda item at the next bo uh, select board meeting. Absolutely. You've made it very easy to come back with a clear delineated <laughs> recommendation. And okay. Thank you for those remarks, <coughs> Madam Chair, but also I want to make very clear that uh, Mr. Rodemarker did the lion's share of the work and analysis on here, so thanking him is uh, mm -hmm. it's important. As always, thank you. Um, uh, just out of matter of form, can I get a motion? You don't even need a motion no, to receive. No, I think I've got Okay, that that's fine. Um, now we go to agenda item 10 for approval so solicitation of additional host community agreements, timeline, revised process, and application. Uh, Attorney Hine, Town Council Hine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm aware of how many people are waiting for a Warren article hearing, so I'm going to try to keep this brief, but if there are questions, I'd be happy to go further into the history of the HCA application process. As the board and the public will recall, the board uh, had a solicitation process for host community agreements where it received four applicants for three potential special permits. Special permits are awarded by the um, redevelopment board based on uh, zoning and environmental design review criteria. But as an initial step, every adult use marijuana retailer must obtain a host community agreement first. Um, you awarded two based on your selection criteria. I'm here before you tonight uh, because we have a third uh, potential, we have room for a third potential uh, licensee to ask for you to affirm the HCA process and application. It's been updated only to reflect that there is likely to be only room for one more um, HCA, given your criteria, giving both the zoning bylaws criteria and your criteria, um, and that I'm asking the board for a deadline to receive applications and a date that you would expect to um, receive presentations and hold your hearing to make a decision on those applications. Mr. Carroll. Madam Chair, so there are no other changes to what, to our, through you, Madam Chair, no mm -hmm. other changes to Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Kiro, the only substantive changes are essentially stating that um, there's two app HCAs have already been awarded and therefore it's unlikely that there could be one in East Arlington or in the Heights yep. and that folks should consult with either inspectional services planning or both to determine whether their location is viable given the buffer zones between marijuana establishments. Yeah. So um, I realize this is coming forward because there, there have been some inquiries, um, but it seems to me that it's, it's with us to kind of set the timeline. And I think that last year we tried to, recognizing how time intensive it was, both to prepare for this hearing and read all of the materials that are submitted and to, to have the hearing itself, I think we tried to aim it for late May with the hopes that we'd be through town meeting at that point. I don't know if that creates any any issues, especially taking a vote that. Um, are you saying, if, if I may, are you saying, that, and then I have Mr. Uh, if Attorney Heim has some comments, and then Mr. Hurd, are you saying late May for um, starting this? I'm saying a similar timeline. So whatever the timeline, I forget, I forget what what our deadlines were mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. last time. I think it was like mid May or where we had. The, the deadline for receipt, and we had late May, we, we had the hearing. Um, but I'm throwing that out as a straw man, there may be other reasons why why that's that's not a reasonable. Uh, town council, uh, town manager. I, I think just to, this is in line with Mr. Kuro's comments that 
we'd want to be cognizant of giving the marijuana study group time to review submissions. I think the board in the past committed to having the marijuana study group review, yeah. comment, and make recommendations. So a timeline that both coordinates with the board schedule and town meeting, as well as giving time for applicants to submit, review by mar study, uh, marijuana study group, then have you have time to digest those before meeting makes uh, makes sense. Okay, Mr. Hurd. You know, Attorney Hyman touched on this, but as I was reading this, in <coughs> as we contemplate getting one more application, my thought was, and I'm sorry if it's already incorporated in here, I missed it, but just adding one thing to the application for this particular community host agreement in the form of like a certification from the applicant to the board that the, the proposed location is not within 2,000 feet of the other current HCA, HCAs that are in process. So as uh, part of the application, uh, it's, you know, this should be a pretty easy to, to determine, but we know precisely that we can actually grant the application. We don't run into the same problem that we did before. Um, whether or not that's something that the board thinks is necessary, I'll leave that to my colleagues. But if that was May last year, that was a warm May night for sure. It was May. <laughs> it was very warm. So. Mr. Carroll. And Chair, through you, just a question for Mr. Mr. Hurd. So I think what you're getting at is that right now our criteria said that it's not, not within 2,000 feet of another establishment, but, but you want to recognize that some of those are in, in process right now, so the establishments don't actually right. exist. So Is we have criteria where if it comes to us and it's within 2,000 feet, then we have to deny it based on, or we don't technically have to deny it because it's the ZBA yeah. that can't allow for the special permit, but if, if this is what we did with the last year, was we took three of the <coughs> applications and we said we only can approve one of your HCAs, not that we were barred from doing so, but just because it would have been useless to send all three to the ZBA. So if we can just add one aspect of it where there's something in writing from the applicant saying that they've done all due diligence, measure the area, and they can confirm that they're not within 2,000 feet of a current applicant. Then I think it adds to the viability that we don't have to check that. Attorney Hyam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we can certainly accommodate that. There's a version of that in the criteria and just for the public and the board's information, while there are certain things about buffer zones in the zoning bylaw that can be waived, one of the things that cannot be waived is the distance between um, retail establishments. So it is a functional way for the board to essentially say, these have got to be uh, within a certain location because otherwise it's not a discretionary matter for the ARB, they can't grant one within a certain distance of another retail establishment. So we can add a certification to the application. Mm -hmm. um, either town council or, or town manager, um, in terms of appropriate spacing in between, um, if my memory serving me that when we had application submissions that date, that the actual presentations were about six weeks later? I'm trying to think how much every, or was, was it longer than that? In, ter in terms of the other commissions that need to weigh in. I believe the initial, Madam Chair, I, I believe mm -hmm. the initial period was scheduled to be shorter and then we extended it extended, a little bit. Right. There's a preliminary, again, I don't want to take up a lot of time on this because I know there's a busy agenda tonight. Mm -hmm. But just so folks know, there's a preliminary review team and there's a marijuana study group as part of that. So there are a lot of me uh, moving pieces before it would get back in front of you. So I think a six week period would be advisable. Okay. So what I was thinking um, is have applications due no later than 12 p.m. Friday, May 15th. And um, this is hard where, you know, um, we haven't scheduled that far out and the board is definitely going to have a d different makeup. But, um, and we have to set a date for when the presentations will be made. So I guess I would um, like to hear from my colleagues regarding Monday, June 22nd or 29th. If, if, if we can look at our calendars right now to see um, definitely amongst the three, if there's a clear date amongst the three of you that you all definitely will Laura, be here. I prefer June 22nd. Pardon me? June 22nd. That works better for you? Okay. <coughs> That's fine. 
What about you, Mr. Carroll? That's all right. I know we're going to get up to May. <laughs> my thing will come up. Uh, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's going to be fine. And while he's looking that up, um, do we anticipate we'll have just one or possibly two applicants? Understanding there may be three, four, or five. Madam Chair, I, we, we've gotten a steady stream of interest. I think there will probably be at least two, potentially more than that. Mm -hmm. um, last time we had a certain expected number. It was a little bit lower, but the first round, I think we expected as many as six or seven, and we ended up with, I believe, uh, four or five. Um, so I, I would expect there to be fewer, but still, it, I wouldn't expect it to just be one. So do, here's my concern. Last time we had four. I think five. Five. We did it all in one night, which was, I think, not as positive a process for, for everybody involved. Um, do we need to set um, sort of a, a backup date if the number, I mean, I can see doing three in one night, and, and it's for the future board to decide, but if we do need an extra night, do we have to set that now, or can we, we as we go along, if we see six come in, we can <coughs> say we need to add an extra one. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Thank Divorce, you, Madam Chair. And I, I think for that night, and that was one of my first meetings, and yeah. <laughs> flew up from Washington that day through Providence, and it, I, I think we just need to have a very light agenda because we had some things that took a lot longer that evening <laughs> yes. before we even got to the hearings. So whether it's three or five, I think other than consent agenda, that probably should be the only thing on the on that night. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Carroll. Um, yeah, 22nd or 29th, they're fine. Um, the, Why well, we say 29th? But should we just put language in here that says applicant presentations shall be made on whatever date or a later date to be determined by the, the select board? But if we say to, application, to cover us? Yeah, yeah, it shall be made starting on um, June 22nd, 2020. So that doesn't mean they have a deadline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so it's not in on that. So th does that work? And yes. you don't need a motion for that, or do you? Uh, you tell me. I, I take a, I take a motion to move uh, approval from, of those dates. For, from those dates and the HCA process that's revised by the select board. Is there a motion to move approval by? So moved. Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any further questions or comments? If not, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous votes. We now go to warrant article hearings. I'm just going to get all my things out, sorry. Okay, warrant article 9, bylaw amendment, canine control fees and fines. Madam Chair, Attorney Hein. If I may. Mm -hmm. um, the long and short of this is the town clerk uh, has received a lot of feedback, or the uh, assistant town clerk has received a lot of feedback that the uh, canine control uh, bylaws penalty for late registration of dogs is uh, seen as too much, and she'd like to reduce it from 50 to $25. 50 to 25. Okay, um, is there anyone here who would like to speak on Warren Article 9? Just to add a little meat, mm -hmm. if I may, oh, yes. Madam Chair, I, to build upon what town council just mentioned, <clears throat> what, what we're being told by the assistant town clerk is this fine structure is actually having sort of a, a counter effect to what we would desire, right? You put fine in place so that you get compliance, what she's finding is that the fine is so high, people are just not registering their dogs, so we're, we're getting less compliance by the nature of the fine. So mm -hmm. to up compliance, lowering the fine seems to be an inappropriate strategy. Okay, is there a motion uh, favorable action or something else? Sorry. I move favorable action. Moved by Mr. Kuro. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any further <coughs> discussion? If not, on the motion... By Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. unanimous vote. Article 10, bylaw amendment, display of notice fines. Mr. Chapter or uh, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is really administrative cleanup. Uh, when we essentially migrated uh, most of what was a somewhat redundant signed bylaw from the town bylaws over to the zoning bylaw, the one remaining piece left were things called notices, which are essentially missing pet signs and other temporary, uh, they're not even really necessarily signs, they're notices, um, that come before the select board in part because the select board regulates public ways and other public areas. Because the bylaw used to be tethered to a state law about outdoor advertising, we were allowed to assess a penalty of $500. 
Since we removed that language, the maximum bylaw penalty is now $300. So it's just something that we need to clean up in the bylaws because we can't assess more than $300 fine for any violation of the bylaws. Move favorable action. Moved by Mr. Hurd. Is there a second? Second. By Mr. Carroll. Uh, Mr. Dunn? Yeah, I think you're about to look to the audience. And yes. Yes. Sir. Um, is there anyone here for Article 10? Um, any further questions and comments? If not, uh, vote of favorable action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Kira. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. Now go to Article 11, Bylaw Amendment, Street Performance Definitions. Um, Attorney Heim? I, I certainly can speak to it. Um, Do you think But that? if um, there's a member here from the Planning Department or from the Arlington Culture, uh, Commission on Arts and Culture, I'd invite them to present the article to you. Just name for the record. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, Thomas Davison, Precinct 11, uh, Commission for Arts and Culture. I just wanted to briefly explain the reasoning behind uh, the uh, amendment. Um, last <coughs> year, for two months, we um, one of the goals for the, for the commission was to activate the, the street performer bylaw. Uh, we started a program called Live Arts Arlington, and over the course of two months, we programmed about a dozen different spaces to, to use the arts to place make throughout the town. Primarily, we worked at Broadway Plaza, a bit in East Arlington, Uncle Sam Plaza. Um, the performers primarily were musicians, dancers, some puppetry. We did have a couple of uh, members that were kind of associate to some of the activities that were happening that were visual artists. And the, the purpose of the uh, amendment for the first definition of what a performer is, is to allow for visual artists. By, I'm trying to work with the, uh, and the committee, our, our commission is trying to work with the definition as the, um, the bylaw is written, which says uh, it prohibits the production of yeah. items for sale. By practice, a painter is producing an item that could be for sale. Uh, that's the goal of this, to allow for um, visual artists to be able to be on the street and take the last year when we did this, um, this program, we allowed for an hour or two for the performance, as it were. If it were, if it were a visual artist, it would be a person painting, doing sculpturing. Uh, we had someone working that engaged with the public, so we think, um, in, in the making of, of something. We think that would uh, allow more Arlington artists to participate in this. So that's the, that's the idea behind this step, the uh, request for the change in this definition. Uh, the second part of the amendment is to allow for uh, street performances in public parks, which currently is prohibited by the bylaw. Um, we have reached out to the Parks and Recreation Commission about this. We've shared the amendment with them. Uh, they have a meeting tomorrow evening, another one uh, on the second week in March. If one of my fellow commissioners can go tomorrow evening to speak with them directly, they will. Personally, I can't make that. If not, I can attend in March. I'm not sure the timing for the board when you uh, need to hear from us about this. Um, but the thought there is we chose to place make with these activities in the cultural district between the center and, and East Arlington. Um, the parks, the public parks specifically, we think that would be impacted by these changes and where we would try to uh, expand our placemaking would be uh, Spy Pond Park, perhaps Crosby Park, but something to kind of fill the gap along the cultural uh, corridor, which there is kind of a dead space in the middle there. So we think that would enhance opportunity for more engagement of Arlington residents with, with the arts. So those are the, those are the points behind mm -hmm. our thinking. We do understand that regardless of, the, of any amendment to the bylaw, the Parks and Rec Recreation Commission still has purview over any sale of product in, in parks. Uh, we'll be speaking with them about that and to get their feedback and thoughts. I don't know if there's any questions or observations. Mr. Hurd. Okay. So just say, I'm very excited to see a bylaw amendment that encourages street performers. I think um, you know we need a little more music and, and art in our around. My question it might be for town council, but I'm a little weary with allowing vendors in public parks in is there any sort of restrictions as to what types of vendors that would now be a you know i understand the rationale that allowing artists to sell their wares that they have on display but as a parent that often goes to the playgrounds i envision people walking through with ice cream carts and you know those carriages with toys and whatnot well 
appear at every public park in Arlington because it's hard to say no to a kid that wants wants a toy. So would those be included in the, if this bylaw was amended? Attorney. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it would depend on whether <laughs> balloon animals are art. <laughs> and I can understand as a parent myself that you don't want any more balloon animals in the house. Um, like silly string. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the way that this is framed right now is around uh, street performers, which has a somewhat squishy criteria of being essentially um, engaged in the creative enterprises as opposed to a vendor for sale of specific items. The Park and Recreation Commission has a fairly long-standing policy with respect to what they allow and don't allow from a vendor perspective. So the Park and Recreation Commission would, would retain quite a bit of control and it might be a better place than the town bylaws to have more specific park rules and regulations on the types of things that can be sold. It's always my recommendation that these things be based on as objective criteria as possible. So for example, like a silly string is essentially a certain type of product that leaves behind a certain type of waste in a park. Um, arguably balloon animals do the same thing in the sense that they're latex or whatever rubber they're made of. You know, if they pop, they create waste. So there are ways that you could try to regulate um, through park rules and regulations what types of things might be allowed and what types of things wouldn't. This is pretty narrow in the sense that it's still caged as essentially people engaged in the creative enterprises. So from that perspective, it's a very clever way of trying to introduce certain types of amenities to the park without having, you know, um, food for sale in, you know, ice cream carts and things like that necessarily. So, I guess, so the answer is that written into the bylaw, there is some sort of restriction that the vendors that were are now allowing in the parks, subject to the approval of the Parks and Recreation Commission, do have to have some sort of creative or artistic value? Or I think the more, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think the, the more precise answer is that the Park and Rec Commission is gonna have to approve any type of commercial activity in the parks and this bylaw won't change that. Mm -hmm. So they have an ability to regulate their parks with an additional layer of things that this bylaw doesn't address. But this bylaw does prohibit that activity. So it's like this is sort of the first layer, and right now it prohibits that type of activity for street performers. Um, and it has a definition of street performers that is somewhat limited. It's not just anybody. So you're, you're working with the definition of street performers, basically allowing street performers in the parks, and then it's gonna be up to parks to decide how much more they wanna regulate, but I want everybody to know that the default regulation now is fairly high. They don't allow basically any commercial activity in the park. So they're gonna have to create an exception or a modification for this. Okay. Anything else said? Um, is there anyone else here who wanted to speak to Article 11? Um, any questions or comments from my colleagues <coughs> or remote Mr. Carroll? I, I'd like to move um, favorable action with um, the suggestion that we um, actually change the name of the section from street performances to outdoor performances given that we're not just talking streets anymore. Mm -hmm. um, is that amenable to my Second. colleagues? <coughs> Seconded by uh, Mr. Dunn. Um, any further questions or comments? If not, on a motion of favorable action by Mr. Kiro, um, as well as to change street performance to outdoor. I think or that outdoors. Would probably be outdoor performance. Outdoor yeah. performance. Seconded or, by Mr. Dunn. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All those opposed, unanimous vote. No. I could open the air. I don't know. Maybe the council can come back. Well. Yeah. Article 12, bylaw amendment, storm water management. Madam Chair, I'd like to invite the environmental planner and a representative of the engineering division to come speak on this bylaw. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Emily Selvin. I'm uh, the environmental planner and conservation agent. <laughs> I have Bill Coppathorn, assistant town engineer. Sorry. All right, so the bylaw amendment um, basically goes in place as a result of the town's current permitting with the EPA. The town's drainage system is permitted by what we call the MS4 permit, uh, again, overseen by the EPA. 
The most recent revision of the permit uh, went into place in 2016 and basically lays out a roadmap for 20 years of actions that the town needs to take in order to remain in compliance with the permit. Uh, one of the very first requirements is to make sure the town has a number of bylaws in place related to stormwater. Um, one is just the stormwater management bylaw that we're here to speak of. There's also a construction amendment that will, or bylaw that will have to be put in place in the coming years and a soil and erosion uh, as well that will be coming down. But this amendment itself, um, while it looks like a lot of changes by words, is actually almost a rebranding of the existing stormwater mitigation bylaw um, as a stormwater management bylaw. Um, the biggest change is, like any good governmental agency, uh, the EPA is requiring us to add a lot of writing to our bylaw. Um, a lot of those details are just to remain in compliance with the permit and don't change the overall bylaw greatly in how we are applying it to the town. So if you are familiar or not with the existing bylaw, it, essentially, it requires that if um, developments are happening on a property and they increase the pervious service on the property by 350 square feet or greater, uh, there's some exceptions to that allow for higher allowances than that right now. And that impervious area could be driveways, houses, sheds, walkways, etc. cetera. Um, the any change you're required to mitigate to make sure there's no more runoff or more volume coming off your site as was under the pre-existing condition. So under the amendment, that remains the same. Um, we tried to provide some clarity as to what constitutes impervious area. I think there was a little bit of uh, vagueness in the existing bylaw that could give uh, some the right to claim, well, okay, in this case, this is not impervious area. We just tried to make that definition a little clearer. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, so uh, within this uh, proposed bylaw amendment, we do refer to some rules and regulations often, and those are still under development. Um, we are working internally with various departments and commissions and boards uh, just to use this bylaw amendment kind of as an opportunity to streamline permitting across the ZBA, the ARB, Engineering Division, the Conservation Commission. Um, so trying to take that opportunity in um, hoping to have a, a draft of those rules and regulations in the coming weeks. We also have a uh, public meeting scheduled for March 10th to review those rules and regulations. Uh, uh, Arlington has done a lot for stormwater uh, over the past few years and we have a lot of residents who are engaged and interested in this topic. So hoping to give them an opportunity um, to give feedback on uh, these rules and regs and, and what we're proposing um, to kind of clarify the permitting process for stormwater management. Attorney Hine. If I may add one thing, Madam Chair. I, I do think it's very important just to summarize some of what uh, these wonderful folks have said is that one of the things that gets difficult with our bylaw scheme where it interacts with certain state regulations and federal laws is obviously we have to go to town meeting to update um, our bylaws anytime we need to make a change. And to the extent that certain things can appropriately be vested in the discretion of rules and regulations, it affords uh, some flexibility while still keeping fieldy to the overall schema of, of the bylaw. And it's an important way of helping these things stay in sync, especially with um, the EPA's permitting process. Okay. Um, any questions? Anyone else? Um, any questions from Mr. Dunn? I'm curious, so for proposed rules of regs, are you thinking that those will be shared on town meeting floor as well? So people, or, or okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Is there a motion? Actually, sorry, I'm gonna oh. vote. Same question. Are they gonna make it into the town, a select board's report <coughs> is another question. Uh, when would they need to be submitted to be included? Ashley, do you know what our print date is? Sometime in March. I don't know the exact date. I, I think we'll have a draft of the rules and regs by mid-March, so uh, we can certainly try to accommodate the, the printing schedule. And so draft rules and regs and fees, or no, you're not looking at? Uh, yeah, fees will be addressed in the rules and regulations. Okay. 
there a motion or? Um, move approval or move recommend uh, positive action. Moved by Mr. Dunn, by Ms. Second by Mr. Hurd. Any further questions or comments by my colleagues? If not, a motion by Mr. Dunn. Favorable action. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Um, we now go to Article 15. Before I call on the proponent, I just want to say very briefly, and I'll talk about this more um, under new business. Um, when I, as the select board chair, met this morning with Andrew Bunnell, the redevelopment board chair, Mr. Chapdelaine, uh, Attorney Heim, and our planning director, Jenny Ray, we went over the warrant um, and uh, recognizing this is fluid, we had um, four warrant articles that definitely thought both boards should report on. Three maybes, and there, there's still a few. Um, depending on the other thing that we discussed on the four warrant articles, and it played um, perfectly here tonight, is which warrant articles um, the redevelopment board felt like they should um, hear and take a vote first, and which one should the select board. And I was guided by um, Andrew, and this, this warrant article 15, this was one that, you know, I asked them, do you think it should be heard by you first? And they said, no, they felt that the select board should. So um, I, I did take some notes of what their comments were, but first I want to hear from um, someone representing the article. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Paul Parisi from Hemlock Street. Um, I've spoken before the select board a few times in the last uh, three to four years about the issues arising from the ongoing residential development activity. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to address these issues tonight. I have some brief remarks and would then be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> this article's primary concerns include creating the ability of residents to have input to the development changes occurring in their neighborhoods to preserving their quality of life and character of the neighborhood, and to minimizing impacts, both temporary and permanent, during construction and redevelopment. The purpose is to allow Arlington to develop and change as it naturally should, while balancing the interests of current residents and the development and real estate communities. I believe current residents have an expectation that the negative impacts to their homes and neighborhood from significant construction and or development activities should be minimized to the extent that it is reasonable. <clears throat> some, some background. <clears throat> Briefly, numerous zoning and administrative issues concerning teardowns, McMansion type construction, and resident and neighborhood quality of life were presented at the 2016 town meeting. While specific article, warrant articles were discussed, none were adopted. However, the town meeting established an informal committee to look into these issues. It was called the Residential Study Group. The RSG, under the direction of the Planning Department, proposed articles <coughs> for the 2017 town meeting covering issues regarding parking, driveway slope, and pre-construction notification, where the Good Neighbor Agreement resulted from that. These articles were passed in the 2017 town meeting. However, many of the primary issues that prompted the formation of the RSG remained uncompleted and are uncompleted to this day when the RSG was unilaterally dissolved by the planning department last spring. These unresolved significant issues include proper notification to abutters prior to project commencement. The good neighbor agreement was passed. However, from a citizen information that was gathered from town records and presented to the redevelopment board last year, the GNA at best has been only about 15 to 20 percent effective in providing the required notifications to abutters. So in addition to that, follow up with residents where the GNA was fully implemented was planned, I think, to go ahead and hadn't and should be done to assess its effectiveness and outcome such that if there should be modifications to this act, it can be made and made more effective. <clears throat> a second issue is environmental and public health impacts during teardown, demolition, excavation, rock removal, and construction. An open issue that remained was my understanding that noise, debris, and safety issues concerning rock removal remain unaddressed and are on the docket in town 
to mitigate situations such as what happened at Irving Street a number of years ago. Stormwater mitigation suitable for some new designs is required, but I have been made aware by some of my neighbors that they now report having periodic water intrusion into their basements after nearby construction where none existed previously. And as was discussed at the 2016 town meeting, very significant quality of life issues concerning the size and scale of new development continue to be produced by new large scale construction. These include loss of sunlight, increased shadowing, loss and reduction of sight lines, loss of privacy, interference with existing or planned solar arrays. <clears throat> uh, more importantly, all these associated effects are exaggerated and made more onerous when an abutter is on a non-conforming lot. Uh, there has been no discussion or consideration of this issue in the town as far as I am aware. <clears throat> in many cases, new home construction, and I've lived here for nearly 40 years, and renovation has been done in an exemplary fashion with significant benefit added to the neighborhood and its abutters. However, in a significant number of cases, issues such as those that I've just discussed above have occurred with both short and long-term negative effects. In my opinion, it's time to try to mitigate these potential issues with active resident participation and feedback. In summary, there is no one body that comprehensively represents residents' opinions and concerns on residential development. I believe this should be the one that the committee that's being proposed would have that as its primary task. I urge the select board to recognize these important residential issues and provide an opportunity to have this Warren article discussed and debated at town meeting. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, and um, we did discuss this this morning and um, I will look to the town manager and town council for anything I don't remember or don't remember correctly. Basically, um, and this is just an informal discussion amongst that group, it's not a representation from the redevelopment board because they've yet to, I think they've scheduled the hearing but they haven't had it yet. Um, this Warren article, it, it really is sort of creating, I couldn't think of a better word, but like a shadow ARB. Um, everything is pretty much the same in terms of um, what the ARB does with the exception of um, the majority uh, well, all of the voting members will not be town employees um, and will be members that we get um, through town meeting and the town moderator um, weighing in on matters that the redevelopment board weighs on, on right now, whose members do have specific expertise and, and um, experience in the area. And then the other thing when I was looking at this, I was just posing it as question, so I'd, I'd also pose it to the proponent that to me, while it, it looks like, you know, sort of a sh shadow ARB, it, it bans town employees in terms of holding any voting or um, leadership roles. But what it does is in order for this second committee to complete its work, it really is going to rely on um, the planning department and its employees who already are doing this work um, for the redevelopment board. And now what it's going to do is you know, someone said, you know, I said, is it going to be duplicative work? It won't be true to true du duplicative work because you can ask for the same thing sometimes, but if you're coming at it with a different premise, you, you can't necessarily repeat the same job, same task to give the same answer. Um, I don't know if I'm encapsulating this correctly. Could I? I think you're doing very well. Okay. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you want me to add any? If you could. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add that I think there's... I think there's governance concerns about the way it's currently laid out. I think it looks as though it has been structured to mimic the authority or run side by side with the authorities and responsibilities of the redevelopment board. Um, I think it's important to mention the Arling members of the Arlington Redevelopment Board are all town residents. Um, it sort of sounds like there's suggestions that this is a resident group to protect against some foreign entity that is the redevelopment board. And I think it's, again, important to reiterate, redevelopment board members are also town residents. I, I generally think that there, we need to find the proper venue for resident participation and engagement in legitimate 
residential concerns, impacts of construction, aesthetics of construction. But uh, there's efforts currently underway that allow for some of that with the residential design guideline effort that's currently underway. And I think there's other ways we could talk about doing it in the future. I do think, again, creating a body that would jockey for power uh, with the ARB before town meeting would be a very dangerous precedent from a governance point of view. And I, I would urge the board to at least give that consideration as you're thinking about this. Mr. Hart? Yeah. To, uh, to compound what Tom Andrew said, we have had, we had a joint meeting a month or so back with the ARB and the purpose of the meeting was it, that we anticipated future proposals in the zoning bylaws. And as part of that meeting, one of the main concerns of both boards was public participation. And we laid out a pretty detailed plan to engage the public at every step of the way as the two boards, mainly the ARB, but in the select board, in conjunction with the select board review, would take the articles that are being proposed and lay them out for public participation and public comment. So to the extent this is in response to last year's town meeting where some of the residents and town meeting members as a whole thought that there wasn't enough public participation in the proposed articles, I don't anticipate that will be the case as you know both boards are sort of moving together on this issue. And again, one of our main goals is to get public input from all members of, of the town. Were you here to speak before we make a motion? You want to come up? Can I have a reply uh, to the comments that were just made? No, 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 if there's a question, but when there's a question, you can definitely respond to it. Um, so. And m m why don't we hear from everybody and then okay. I see where we go from there? Because I just don't want it back and forth, back and forth. You know, it's going to make you all Good evening. I'm Don Seltzer. I live on Irving Street. And I would like to speak in favor of forming this committee. I was a regular attendee at the residential study group meetings. And uh, I was very disappointed when it was terminated last year. I do not agree with the reason given at the time that it had accomplished its mission. The concerns of residents that led town meeting to create the residential study group still exist. The purpose of this proposed committee is to continue on with that mission, not to supp supplement the redevelopment board. This board has undoubtedly noticed that an extraordinary number of residents are running for town meeting this year as well as various town-wide posts. There are several reasons, but one is the perception of how well government is functioning and paying attention to what residents want. Forming this committee is a simple way to address some of these concerns. Failure to do so will send a far different message. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Steve Revelac, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, when I first read Article 15, I thought that, gosh, this sounds a lot like the residential study group. And one of my first, one of the first things I wanted to sort of, uh, I was curious about was, you know, what is the relationship between this group and the RSG? Did the RSG, you know, I know they were finished and the group is dissolved, but did, you know, they really finish or is this, you know, well, I would like to thank Mr. Paris for, um, for explaining that uh, in his earlier comments. Um, now, I do, would, as a town meeting member, um, I would like to understand the motivation for the group composition that's been proposed. So the residential study group had um, sort of a broad con contingency of uh, people. There were, there were residents, there were planners, there were people in the uh, real estate industry and the developers or in who do property development and from my point from my perspective if you're trying to uh, work out you know resolve tension between those different groups getting the different those different groups talking to one another is sort of a, a first step um, I, I do I, I do have some I do question how that's been sort of taken out uh, of this proposal where it seems to be um, shedding diversity specifically by uh, prescribing people who work in real estate or development and, and, and also town employees. 
Uh, finally, I'd, you know, just as a, again, speaking as a town meeting member, I'd like to understand how this proposed, this committee would fit into just sort of the overall structure of things. So the RSG reported up to kind of like the master plan implementation committee, which also fell under the ARB. I'd like to understand where this group would fit into the hierarchy and also how they would collaborate and interact with, you know, with the ARB, with the planning department, with the housing plan implementation committee, and with the work that this body is, um, will be per, um, doing with the ARB over the next year or two. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Oh, uh, Mr. Dunn, did yeah, you? Um, so I actually have a couple questions mm -hmm. for the proponent, if that's sure. okay. So uh, my first question is, so how do you envision this group what do you envision this group's relationship with the ARB to be? I envision this group to be in a similar position as to what the RSG was. This is not a group that will propose new bylaws or new standards or be able to promulgate them, but will be able to raise issues that residents consider significant to the appropriate bodies in town so that they can have action on them. Uh, part of what has prompted this is the issues I've listed have been around since 2016 have been adequately discussed at town meeting and in other forums at ARB meetings. None of these issues have been taken up for resolution. In my opinion, some of these are significant issues to residents that exist uh, currently in town uh, to their quality of life and so forth. So uh, we're not trying to usurp the ARB's duties. We're not trying to promulgate new laws, we certainly won't have authority to do that. We are trying to get independent residents that are not affiliated with the town or with developers and contractors and real estate people to express their opinions as to how their neighborhoods are being preceded. Now, the issue of not having any developers or contractors on the board, that's not true. All the article says is a majority shall be independent residents. The other people on the board, could be town employees, could be people from the planning department, could be real estate uh, developers and so forth. It only said a majority should be residents independent of any of these ties. The balance of the board or the committee can be whoever decides. And I left it up to the town moderator. I trust the town moderator to create a balanced committee. Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd for whatever it's worth, the warrant article directly states that this body would develop recommendations for proposing new zoning and general bylaws. So that's in direct conflict with the proponent's right. comments. So I well, then I, I misspoke. I'm, I'm saying we're not we're not the ones creating the new laws. We're creating the recommendation for things. But that's not what it says. And, and the other thing that there was great concern about was in order for this shadow committee to be able to. Um, conduct its activities, it's basically going to rely on a, a lot of people <coughs> through the employees through the per, uh, planning department who are already are performing a similar function and task um, with the ARB. And, and I understand the concerns, and that's as Mr. Hurd, my colleague, um, stated before, that's why, um, and I'll have more to report as well, the town manager under new business that we started the joint redevelopment board, select board meeting over at the soon to be community center and um, had that conversation um, with citizens and outlined a very um, uh, detailed next steps in terms of meetings and meetings with the public and, and defining that. But um, I understand what you're saying, um, but it, it really is creating another ARB. I know you're saying you're not going to do certain things, but it is in here that says you are. So Mr. Dunn, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you had it, the floor, I'm sorry. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, I, I think I, yeah. Um, sometimes, so a lot of times when we have warrant article hearings, uh, sometimes we say, okay, there's a different way to address this problem and we try to do it without, you know, making a bylaw change or, or, or uh, doing something like that and I'd say, that I have recognized a lot of the concerns that came up in, that specifically would come up in 2016, but have been there before and have been there since. Some of the reasons that there's, uh, is they're very difficult problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, uh, it, that it isn't that for lack of wanting to fix them, but it is through a lack of difficulty. And I, I just one of, are you, 
did you, are you familiar with, did you see the joint meeting that we had with the ARB and the plan that we laid out there? I so was I, there. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I apologize for not, I don't remember who's no, at I, every right. uh, uh, um, meeting. But we have set on a course, it's like, you know, a year, year and a half schedule that is meant to really solicit a lot of town input from a lot of different people and then put forward a series of articles and uh, that would, you know, some of which would be addressing some of the problems you've described. And so I would be strongly inclined to let that process run its course before I tried to, uh, uh, before I thought that it was time to uh, try something else. Um, any questions, comments? My colleagues, Mr. Kiro. I mean, I, I think uh, I would just e echo Mr. Dunn's um, sentiment here. I'd, I'd like to see how that process uh, plays out. And some of the issues that were that were listed are already subject to public hearing requirements. So anything that falls under environmental design review has to have considerations of preservation of landscape, relation of buildings to environment, open space circulation, surface water drainage, Utility service, advertising features, special features, safety, heritage, microclimate, sustainable building, site design. Some of these are some of the same issues that were enumerated here. Um, and there, there is a, a means on a project by project basis to um, address those. It's already in law that those have to be um, considered. I understand if there, there are enhancements to the laws. I mean, I think that's, that's probably the part or the bylaw to to um, to look at, but I would like to see the process that we we've, we've gone through and we went back and forth with the IRB, and and I think it was very important that we did that too because um, it was recognized that I think it was recognized that when some very controversial zoning issues came forward to town meeting last year, quite frankly, our voice wasn't there, and our voice wasn't there because we didn't have a mechanism. To, 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 um, to work through that. And in developing that mechanism, I think we mutually insisted that there be a strong public input component. So I'm, I'm not inclined to set up another structure and another committee to, to confuse that process just as we're getting it off, mm -hmm. off, um, off the ground. Um, so that, that's kind of where I'm at. I understand <coughs> where, what your, the types of things that you bring forward. I mean, but that, I've lived them. I think what I'm hearing is a no, uh, motion of no action, or? So move, I recommend, I uh, move, we recommend no action. Moved by Mr. Dunn, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Kiro. Any further questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous you. vote. Thank you, I appreciate having this discussion. Yeah. We'll, we'll continue. It's important. Thank no, you. No, we'll continue. And I'd like to submit my statement for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting there, Mr. Brown. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a test in case you're <laughs> endurance. A um, resilience test, yeah. <coughs> uh, Article 18, vo vote by law amendment. Envision Arlington updated language. I'm Julie Brazil. I'm the chair of the Envision Arlington Standing Committee. and. I just, uh, the memo gives you the sort of the summary and I wanted to show you the red line um, just so it was clear. Um, we were really just changing a few words here and there. The rationale is sort of three parts. Um, there's still a couple places in the bylaw that mention um, Vision 2020 and our name is Envision Arlington now. So it's nice to go in and tidy that up. Mm. We also want to go ahead and um, update the, some of the specific wording, just do some light editing to the nine town goals. And then we want to sort of start this process of relabeling the goals so that we all get in the habit of calling them value <coughs> statements because that's really what they are. <coughs> Each of the nine statements starts with the words we value. So um, part of the reason historically that they were called town goals was because in the early 90s, this was a really big project. Everyone was working on it. It was all consuming for a lot of people. And they wanted to be sure that what was adopted um, was sort of strong and actionable. And so they said, town goals. Um, they are value statements. They're vision statements. And they're very broad and aspirational. They're not really things you 
check off. You, you're always working to do better, to live up to those, uh, the values that we aspire to as a community. So I think it's really a nice idea here in the 30th anniversary, as we go into town meeting 2020, that we go ahead and um, shift gears. And there's sort of two reasons why that's a good thing. One, um, it fits in better, if you call them vision statements, then when work is happening, exactly the same way that reports and, and projects and, and recommendations are made to the town by all kinds of committees and departments, you have that vision statement, the value statement, you have goals that you're working on for the next few years and action steps to um, carry that out. By calling it, by calling them town goals, it just kind of confuses the process um, because they're not goal statements. Um, they're not actionable in the way that a concrete um, example would be. So for example, in the um, early reports um, in 1993, town meeting adopted um, the, the goal statement, but it's a really a value statement. We value education for all residents. The goal in that report was to hire and retain good teachers, and the action step was to do a salary study. So it's a very logical progression. Um, and so I really want to try and bring the Envision Arlington group of committees into alignment with the way that really the rest of the town operates. So we'll rename them something along the lines of statements are of our community values. And then <clears throat> I think that makes it, and then the, the editing that we want to do is to create a solid foundation because at the time in 1993, it was clearly the idea that the goals could be updated from time to time as, as new ideas came along. In practice, that's really hard because we now have 80-something committees and projects and departments and um, grant studies all the time. And it would be really difficult to, to invite the public to a forum to talk about whether we should include sustainability and transportation in our environment goal while we're actually doing that work. Um, it's, it's confusing to people to stop and worry about the wording when we're actually trying to implement those ideas. So the perfect world would be we have these nine foundational values that sort of drive all of our work. And, and that's happening now. Um, I think we're really just trying to get the wording to, to coordinate. The open space and recreation plan from 2015, which is being updated now, for um, a new one will be done in a couple years, uh, uses its introduction to talk about the town goals, both the culture and recreation goal and the environment goal that sort of are connected to the work of the open space and recreation plan. <clears throat> and so they introduce the goals, which are now values, and then talk about their sort of their mission, which is to um, make sure that uh, Arlington's community uh, gets a greater sense of awareness and appreciation for the town's open space. And then the report goes on to lay out specific goals for the next few years. <clears throat> I apologize, sitting here, <laughs> I've lost my voice. Um, <laughs> so I'm really um, done. That's really the idea. We want to just sort of bring it all in line with the way things are done in Arlington. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, anywhere, uh, questions first, I guess? Um, Anyone else here? Okay. Um, is there a motion by one of my colleagues? Move comments? approval. Moved by Mr. Kiro. Second. Second yeah. by Mr. Hurd. Um, if no further questions or comments on the motion, favorable action by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous, unanimous vote. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. Thank you, Thank you Julie. Julie, will you share those red lines? With Next, me we now? go to Article 22, Home Rule yeah. Legislation for Justin Brown. Madam Chair, may I? Yes. Um, thank you, members of the board. Before uh, Mr. Brown speaks, I just want to remind the board of the and the public, such as it is, who are still here. Wait one second. I'm sorry. Could you take it outside? No. I'm sorry. I apologize because I I I'm, I have hearing loss in this ear. I can't hear what he's saying. Could you start again? I sure. Just before. Uh, Mr. Brown is going to speak. I just want to remind folks of the general posture of what's before the board. The civil service law in Massachusetts, as applied to Arlington, essentially uh, states that in order to sit for an exam for police or fire, you have to be um, under 32 at the time you take the exam, or the last date the exam is available. 
um, that can be circumvented by home rule legislation as it has been from time to time. I've outlined some of the thought processes of the board in the past, but um, I've also included, if the board is so inclined to move positive action, what that special legislation would look like. I would need one detail for Mr. Brown, which is his age, which has to be put in the special legislation. I wouldn't normally ask. Um, so with that, unless the board has any questions, I think it's appropriate to hear from Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I am here tonight to uh, hope that you will consider uh, home rule legislation that would allow me to become eligible uh, for appointment to the Arlington Fire Department, although I have reached an age beyond 32, and that age is 38. <laughs> um, my sole motivation really is that I am uh, very interested and passionate about serving our community and protecting our community at a uh, first, first responder capacity. Uh, I actually started taking the civil service exam back in 2014. I've taken it a number of times <coughs> since then. That was actually the last time I was technically eligible in Arlington, but of course there are other um, towns uh, that allow uh, higher age limits. Um, I would much rather be uh, eligible in Arlington if that's possible. I've been here uh, 10 years. Uh, my family and I love it here and hope to, to stay here uh, forever. Um, and I'd just lastly say that uh, in, in pursuit of, of uh, this, I've recently uh, completed an EMT program. So I'm currently a nationally registered EMT and I'm working through uh, Mass OEMS to get my Massachusetts State certification. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been taking civil service exams since 2014. Uh, a, a quick, very brief bit of my own history. Uh, I have had a career in technology, uh, product, and, and program management. Um, I am uh, the first in my family, my mother and father did not attend a university. I was fortunate to do so, and at the time, um, the pressures positive for sure were to go into a field that was a good uh, field with a lot of uh, potential uh, in the future, and that was technology. And I'm very proud of uh, my career and accomplishments thus far. I try to move my career in technology to a, a better align with, with my values. I went from ad tech to uh, national public radio, uh, then went to work at MIT uh, to try to advance at online education. All worthy pursuits, uh, but still felt a bit empty to me. So this is, uh, again, since a uh, year, a few years back, really wanted to serve my community, my country, help uh, uh, serve uh, our community and, and citizens. So that's my motivation. Thank you. Um, any questions, comments by my colleagues? Mr. Yeah, DeCourcy? Thank you. I respect your willingness to to serve. Just a, a question as to, my understanding is there's another civil service exam coming up in March. There is one in March. Is that, is that your intent to take that exam? Yes, yeah, so I, I intend to take, I've signed up to take that exam uh, and the eligibility for that exam I think comes out in August time frame. So I believe whatever decision is made here would impact uh, eligibility at that. Okay, and, and this may be a question for town council, but that exam, how long is that list in for, from that exam, is that a two-year uh, eligibility for two years after the exam? Okay, I, I, I believe generally, so. Generally speaking, yeah. Okay, All right. and, and the reason why I, I, I ask that is, for some of the um, other, other town residents who've come before the board in the past, where they've come before and have sought a waiver to the age 32, there's been a sunset provision on it. So, in other words, that it may be for a period <coughs> of a couple years. So, if the waiver is granted it would be for as long as the next list is in effect. And I don't know if, if you have any uh, feelings on, on that, if, 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 that if, if we did go that route, if that uh, is something that uh, you could agree to. Uh, absolutely, I think that is, is totally reasonable, especially given that the, the way the civil service exam works is the two-year eligibility. I think fire and police alternate years, and then when that uh, eligibility list is established, it's good for two years, okay. and then there's an expiration date. Okay. Uh, so that, that would be, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, I definitely, I was, um, from long before I was on the board, when I was in a town meeting, I definitely I tend to support these. 
and I support them mostly because I think that the civil service law is uh, needs a reform, and I don't think that it is serving us or our town employees well in its current form, and especially because you know the alternatives to using the age requirement are not particularly implementable by town, and so I just uh, I much prefer to let the um, the police chief and then the hiring process uh, find the right people, and so uh, I would like to move. A, uh, I would re like to recommend favorable action on this article, um, and definitely including um, Mr. De uh, like a sensible sunset date to be. I can do that. Second. Moved by Mr. Dunn, uh, seconded by Mr. Hurd, um, and we'll work out what the sunset date is. But I'm hearing up to two years, possibly. Um, but I want to commend you for doing this. Um, I can tell you personally, um, the first time that this was introduced, it, well, it came before as a Warren article and then it turned into the board did it on a case-by-case -case basis in the beginning because it was something that I had worked on when I first got on the board and um, the people who have gone before you really have laid the framework and foundation for this to be an avenue for really qualified candidates that unfortunately, you know, have done everything they could possibly do, and because of a certain number, um, that, that process ends there. And as Mr. Dunn said, you know, being able to have, whether it's police chief, fire chief, et cetera, you know, at least have a proper applicant pool to consider. Um, and I can tell you personally, I won't name them. Um, in the future, if things go the way they should, you'll know exactly who they are, they'll tell you. But I can tell you on those um, that um, I work with and others, but. I've done a lot of work on this. They're, they're some of the um, best um, police officers that, that we've had on the force and uh, one firefighter. So um, I want to thank, uh, unless there's any further questions or comments uh, on a motion by Mr. Dunn with uh, favorable action with the sunset clause to be determined up to two years. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank you for hanging in there. Thank Welcome. you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we now go to final votes and comments. Article 7, Article 8. Madam Chair, if it so pleases, I'd love to have a chance to re-vote to turn these into five zeros. Okay. Uh, there's a motion to... It's not a man. A motion to uh, have the votes reflect a five zero um, vote. Uh, is there a second to that? Second. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, if not, on a motion to approve as well as to reflect a 5 0 vote on a Article 7 and Article 8 <coughs> by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kira. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Um, we now go to correspondence received. We have one piece of correspondence. Um, is there a mo motion to receive by so Mr. Carroll, seconded by? Second. Uh, Mr. Dunn? Any? Okay, on a motion, move received by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Uh, we now go to new business, Ms. Marr. Oh, I think you said you. you didn't we say you were going to have something? Oh, yes, I did. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, we're looking to put the warrant available online this week, and we just want to make sure that everybody on the board is okay with the warrant the way it is now to be posted midweek. Is that all right? Because we're getting a lot of calls. Yep. Can you accept Any nods? Other? <laughs> yes, I do accept nods. <laughs> Any other new business? No new business. That's right. <laughs> Attorney High. One small matter, uh, as the board knows, my office is a little short-staffed right now, and I really just want to thank the rest of my staff, mm. our administrative staff, Mr. Buckley, the paralegal, who uh, have really stepped up wonderfully to help fill in the gaps um, while we're trying to find a replacement for the irreplaceable Mr. Marlenka. Thank you. Mr. I'll, I'll just add one piece of new business that I know the board is already aware of, but it's important to mention, um, that unfortunately we uh, lost our recreation director, Stacey Mulroy, to Needham, uh, to become the recreation director in Needham. But fortunately, uh, we were able to recruit on an interim basis the recently retired fire chief, Bob Jefferson, to come back as our interim <laughs> recreation director. Uh, so I, I share that because in just a week's time, he is um, feet for, uh, head first, dove right in, and uh, is tackling some of the challenges in the rink, some of the challenges in the recreation programming, some of the parks and playground challenges. And though he has no interest in being the permanent recreation director, 
uh, we're lucky to have him in <coughs> his management and experience and uh, knowledge of town uh, town government. So, uh, if you're around the rink, uh, you can go see the chief. I so agree. I had the good fortune to happen have, happen to see him his first day, and uh, <laughs> nice. it was funny how he was telling me that you know the town manager called me, and I said I don't know, I got I got to think about it. And as he's talking to me, he's saying it like that, and he goes, you know, and I thought about it overnight, and you know then. I got up the next morning, and I was thinking, you know, in terms of facilities, what really needs to be done, and, 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 and he just, this kept at the step, that, um, and uh, I was like, oh, this is such a perfect fit, and I never would have thought of it, um, you know, in terms of his years of experience in many facets serving the town, so. Um, I'll add one thing to that. There, I've had one recurring complaint that I won't talk about in public that I've given the town manager about the condition of the rink, and I read the email that Bob Jefferson was taking over, I went to the rink, and it was resolved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like magic. It's not a surprise. Well, look how well he did with all the, all the firehouses or fire stations. But From I'm sorry. From my perspective, he's doing great. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Chaplin. That, that's all I have. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, um, it's the last week of February, but the, the high schools are entering their own form of March Madness, and I want to uh, wish the high school teams that, are, that have made tournament all the best. The, the girls' basketball team played tonight. Hopefully they won at Andover. The girls' hockey team opens their tournament Wednesday night at the Ed Burns Arena, and there's a, a young player, a grandchild of a member who's usually here with us tonight, Maddie Kropelka, is on the Arlington girls' team, and I wish Maddie and, and the girls all the success in the world. And then Thursday night, the boys' hockey team starts their quest for another state championship, and uh, they are the second public high school to be the number one seed in the Super 8. So congratulations to Coach Missouri. I should point out that the first team was Winchester High years ago, also coached by John Missouri. So hmm. best of luck to Arlington High to all the, the teams that uh, made the tournament. Mr. Dunn? Uh, just remind everybody that early voting is open. If you want to uh, come in and vote, it is open, uh, town hall is open from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, for, it was open today, but it's open Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, it is open until 7 p.m. On Friday, it is open till 5 p.m. <coughs> so all of those hours, you can come in and do your primary voting. And if you don't get your early voting, then come in on March 3rd. <coughs> Mr. Hard, Mr. Carroll. Um, just one piece of business. Yesterday, the chair and I um, attended a, a um, a farewell uh, event for um, uh, Mel Goldsipe and her, her husband, uh, Arthur. Um, Mel, um, I think we all met Mel, and she was uh, on the Human Rights Commission, and, and um, as the co-chair, she, she really pushed a number of important efforts, including our safe um, communities, uh, our uh, Trust Act, um, and um, the expansion of our um, our bylaw provisions for protected classes include gender expression identity, and was a mover in the, um, and then a leader in, in um, our uh, Rainbow Commission. Um, did so much in such a short time, and uh, talking to her, her new home, she's already trying to get, you know, replicate some of the success there. And so uh, we wish her and uh, Arthur well, I know, and we love you, Mel, and, and good luck. And, and we also met the two new, two new co-chairs who have an awful lot of energy. And um, I have four hopefully brief ones just to sort of <coughs> segue into that. That was going to be one of the end things. Um, also yesterday there was Christine Bongiorno. When I saw her, um, I, I had received an email from somebody, a resident around the um, Arlington High School rebuild project. And mindful of the conversations we've had, I thought to myself, I'm not going to send this to the town manager. I think this sounds like a Board of Health, Christine Bongiorno, and I said, I emailed her and said, I'm starting with you. Uh, let me know where to go from there. And, and my goodness, didn't she email me back within an hour of an answer? Um, which, and then when I saw her down at Mel's um, going away uh, send-off party, I, I said to her, you know, I hope you're remembering when, you know, when you get anything from any member of the board, unless it's something that's emergent, you know, Board of Health issue, you know, I hope you're remembering, you know, that you have your family, your downtime. And she said, no, she's, she's mindful, cognizant of that. Um, she just happened to be on for something else, because um, I said it can creep over. And to that endeavor, in terms of um, what the board and the town manager discussed, um, 
in terms of sort of setting up a framework um, for not only a current town manager and or any other department heads, but a future town manager and department heads. Um, the town manager has been meeting with um, Karen Malloy, um, getting the framework of that and taking the ne next step to make that happen. And I have been following up on that, just basically sort of a check off to see that that's happening. So that particular d discussion we had has um, is moving along, um, but it's gonna take some more time for that to come to fruition. The last two things, um, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Chapterling to speak to the second part of this. Um, we did have that joint meeting this morning, Redevelopment Board, myself, uh, Town Manager, Chapterling, Attorney Hine, Planning Director, Jenny Ray, um, ARB Chair, Ed Bennell. So we did go through um, all the Warren articles and recognizing this still is fluid, something could be added, taken off. Um, what we did was, so just so, um, I know we've all reviewed the warrant, but I don't know if it gone as a further review. There were four warrant articles that um, Andrew and I uh, agreed the board, both boards should report on. 13, 15, 19, and 20. We obviously did 15 tonight, so then they'll um, do that. And then there was only um, one, the other articles, they wanted the select board to um, hold the hearing first with the exception of, which one was it? There was one they wanted, and I have everything down as select board. Municipal Housing Trust Fund, was that the one they wanted to do first? So um, we've already done 15. Um, they want us to do 13 and 20, and they want to do 19 before. So we're gonna, I'm going to adjust the, the maybes, which to me they seem like similar warrant articles, are 35, 36, and 43. Um, and then, Mr. Chaplain, if you could talk about the second piece. Certainly. So to, to piggyback, to piggyback on that, I will say that um, we we thought that well, we I think we all agreed that those three articles you just mentioned, all in re uh, relation to parking requirements or parking minimums uh, in the B3 and B5 zoning district, which has really come to light at the Heights Pub, um, that there's three articles to try to deal with that. They're likely to take a vote on one of those articles. That that could be something that this board. Uh, thinks about weighing in on. More generally, there's a lot of citizen articles in regards to zoning and um, not presuming what the ARB's uh, action will be, but regardless of their action, we thought that if they laid out a memorandum to this board with a rationale for their action, uh, laying that out, the board could then receive that and choose to do what it wants to do from there. And just to try to keep up the dialogue that we talked about at the joint meeting, but there was nothing else that we clearly thought that the select board should be weighing in on at this point. Um, am I neglecting something else? Um, what you will have to work with the future chair of the select board. We kind of set up a framework for the. Joint oh board. yes, thank you. So, um, actually, Chair Mahan had a very good, a, a very good recommendation this morning that we all thought uh, would work very well of working with the next chair to set up a goal setting session, like we talked about with the ARB, where we find um, a time frame. Maybe it's a Saturday morning. Maybe it's not, but. Uh, what was suggested was, let's say, starting at 8.30, one of the boards meets for an hour, an hour and a half alone to do a goal-setting session. The next board comes in for an overlapping hour, hour and a half, and then that board that came in stays for a remaining hour, an hour and a half to do its own goal-setting session so that we can maximize the efficiency of everybody's time and get that goal-setting done, both for each individual board as well as jointly. So, um, I think And recognizing everyone needs to accept unless we're <clears throat> all the stars align, there's probably going to be a person. If we can find the perfect date that both boards, all five, can meet, then that's great. But um, I think we have to, I think sometimes what happens is we set it, and then, you know, it, it kind of gets reset. I think it, it just says, oh, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I also mean sometimes, and it's going to be through the town manager um, and his office in terms of, when they send out whatever it is, Google, Google alert or something like that. I don't want it to be that, oh, you know, we're missing one person, let's try to find another, you know, put out two or three dates, and, yeah. but I'll, I'll leave that for him. As well as um, what we talked about earlier in terms of citizen, future citizen hearings, we're, uh, we're adhering to the matrix and the outline that we distributed the other night. Okay, and then my last, um, very briefly, briefly um, uh, my colleague, Ms. Rowe, 
had a MUGAR coalition meeting yesterday, Mr. DeCourcy and I um, sort of interface in, in, into that. Um, and um, the reason for, because there's a lot of questions coming up in terms of ZBA, Oak Tree, um, where that process is going. Everybody's looking to March 31st. Some people were hearing that um, Oak Tree may ask for an extension for that and or may not be ready. Um, as far as I'm aware, that request hasn't been made, Attorney Heim. It is not. So we're anticipating the March 31st. If there's anything that changes, Madam Chair, I'll make sure that everybody knows. I know this is an intense matter of interest for the board, the public. Mm -hmm. I'll try to make sure that that gets communicated as early as possible. And um, what, I'm sorry, I understand no, no. That, that it's up to the ZBA whether to grant any further postponements or adjournments. Sure. And, and so what they've done is, you know, they've um, updated the MUGAR Coalition website. They really want to direct people to there. Um, you know, they want to get the lawn signs out again, coming up with a revised, you know, frequently asked questions. Um, and one of the things that we suggest that they should do is sort of put a um, posting out um, on the MUGAR Coalition website, pencil in these dates. Because <coughs> just... Um, kind of like the Z last ZBA meeting, it kind of happened and everybody had, you know, a short amount of notice. So we wanted to tell people these are possibilities, but just so you could be around. <coughs> really encouraging people to go to the MUGAR Coalition website on Facebook. It has a link to their website on the internet um, because there are a few, posi every position has been filled, but I'd like to have a second person there. So, and as I said, Mr. DeCourcy and I will continue to, um, be, you know, avail ourselves of, of assisting with them in any way. Um, if that's the case, I'll take a motion to adjourn by so Mr. Carroll, seconded by Second. Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. Our next meeting will be March 9th, 2020.